This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 208th edition of the program. Today is Friday, August 30th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which signed up for the very first time to support us this week, and that includes Alderman Gomez, Colton Austin, Dylan Bundy, Gothic One, Gene Eidelman, J. Rob Wilson, Kyle O'Dell, Feng Quach, Sam O, Tosca, and William Hudson. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support or by checking out patreon.com forward slash humanistreport or underneath any one of our YouTube videos you can click join so this week on the humanist report podcast bernie sanders surges in the polls elizabeth warren is buttering up democratic party elites donald trump wants to nuke hurricanes literally bernie sanders goes after mitch mcconnell on his home turf fox news attacks bernie sanders for caring about climate change andrew yang doesn't like what bernie sanders had to say about universal basic income Bernie Sanders talks about how he'd deal with Jair Bolsonaro and put pressure on him to protect the Amazon rainforest. Sean Hannity is triggered by Bill Maher's response to David Koch's death. And finally, we will talk to 2020 congressional candidate Rebecca Parson about her progressive political campaign. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today. I am incredibly excited, so let's go ahead and uh, get to it. I think it's safe to say that Bernie Sanders has had an incredible week. So as you all know, last week on the show, we talked about how he has proposed numerous sweeping policy proposals, criminal justice reform, a workplace democracy pro-union plan, uh, a Green New Deal, which would potentially save the planet. And these proposals, generally speaking, have been received very well. Now, on top of that, he received an endorsement from the United Electrical Workers Union, which is huge. And also, polling is starting to show that he is, in fact, reclaiming his spot at the top. Now, as a general rule, you never really want to rely too heavily on just one poll individually because polling data is much more reliable and stable at the aggregate level. However, Polls are still useful at the individual level because they tell us that there may or may not be a sudden shift coming. And one poll from Monmouth University is demonstrating that maybe the tide is starting to turn in Bernie's favor even more and against Joe Biden. Now, I tend to not talk about individual polls, but this poll is important because it has the potential to unilaterally on its own transform national dialogue because up until this point even though bernie sanders has solidly remained in second place you know it seems as if everyone is just focusing on biden and to a lesser extent elizabeth warren and just ignoring bernie sanders but this new poll from monmouth makes it very difficult to not take bernie sanders seriously and as max greenwood of the hill reports joe biden's support in the race for the democratic presidential nomination is slipping according to a new survey from monmouth university poll that shows the former vice president dropping below 20 percent. The survey showed Biden with support from 19 percent of Democratic and Democratic-leaning voters nationally, a double-digit decline from Monmouth's most recent poll in June when he led the pack with 32 percent. Now, the dynamics have changed. According to the Monmouth survey, Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, the primary field's top progressive candidates, are each at 20 percent, putting them in a statistical tie with Biden and indicating a tightening three-way race. So this obviously is phenomenal news. Now a little bit more about this poll. It includes a random sample of 800 adults who were contacted both via cell phone and landlines. And it does have a relatively large margin of error at 5.7 percentage points. And generally, you want to try to keep that under 5%. However, demographically speaking, this poll actually does seem representative of the general public. 
and it does have a good mixture of young and old voters as well as different racial groups. So, you know, this is good. Now, getting to the results. As you can see, both Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are tied for first place with 20%, and Bernie Sanders got the largest bump in terms of percentage. And Joe Biden is now in a statistical tie with Bernie and Warren at 19%, so he's just one point behind. But he did see the biggest decrease, which is in the double digits, as the article pointed out. And when you compare his numbers, you know, from August to June, this drop is absolutely devastating for Joe Biden. Now, you then see Kamala Harris in a distant fourth place with 8%. Cory Booker and Pete Buttigieg tied for fifth with 4%. Andrew Yang in fifth with 3%. Julian Castro, Beto O'Rourke, and Marianne Williamson tied for 6th place with 2% each, and Bill de Blasio, Tulsi Gabbard, and Amy Klobuchar tied for 7th place with 1% each. Now, everyone else is either polling at less than 1% or 0% with a total of 10% of voters saying that they are undecided. Now, when it comes to who's leading in states with early primaries here, we see Elizabeth Warren with the biggest jump at 20%, tied with Biden and Bernie in third with only a 1% jump in comparison with June. Now, the biggest aspect of this story, arguably, is that Joe Biden took a gigantic hit in the polls. And polling is starting to show more and more that this primary is starting to shape up into a standoff between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, which is actually good news because these are two of the better options in this race. You see a ton of corporate Democrats and centrists. So to see the more left-wing candidates kind of be the front runners, that is good. Although we do have to defeat Elizabeth Warren because when it comes to her versus Bernie, I'm sorry, the difference is still night and day. Even though she is better than Biden and I'm glad to see her overtake Biden, Bernie Sanders is the candidate who wants to change the system itself and not just reform it. So when it really does come down to a race between Bernie and Elizabeth Warren, if that is in fact the case, then I think it will be useful for us to focus more heavily on the differences between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. But for now, um, it still makes sense that we continue to drive home the point that Joe Biden is not electable. Joe Biden is a gaffe machine and Joe Biden... He doesn't have the policies, he's not going to excite the base, and he could potentially lose to Donald Trump. And what's really odd is that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, they are not cutting into each other's bases. One is not taking votes away from the other. However, what I would not have expected, you know, prior to this primary is that Bernie Sanders is actually the second choice for a lot of Joe Biden's supporters. So the implication with regard to the Monmouth poll is that as, you know, Joe Biden goes down... Bernie Sanders goes up. In other words, Biden's loss is Bernie's gain, weirdly enough. And I think that a lot of this has to do with name recognition and not necessarily so much with policy. So assuming that Joe Biden will continue to fall, that should theoretically give Bernie Sanders a boost over Warren if, you know, Bernie Sanders does remain the second choice for a lot of Biden supporters. But again, I want to stress that this is just one poll. It could very well be an outlier, so I don't want to get your hopes up just yet. But it could signal a change, you know, in this race. This could change the dynamic. And again, this could very well mean that national dialogue changes just because this poll is so devastating for Joe Biden. And it could kind of become this self-fulfilling prophecy where this poll leads to mainstream news pundits asking questions about whether or not Joe Biden is dropping. And then, you know, that is reflected in the polls because that becomes the narrative. So it's still important to talk about individual polls just for purposes of kind of setting you know, or changing really the narrative. Now, the reason why I really wanted to cover this, even though I try to stay away from individual polls, is because of the response that this garnered. All of the headlines now from Politico, The Hill, they're all saying that uh, Biden is falling and Bernie is rising, as well as Elizabeth Warren. And I have to share with you the response from MSNBC, because they basically up until this point, believed that Joe Biden just couldn't possibly fall. They largely ignored Bernie Sanders. Even Nate Silver, you know, the whiz kid, apparently, claimed that this would be a race between Joe Biden and Elizabeth Warren. But now this poll is changing the discourse. And it's really nice to see that. So this is a compilation of MSNBC clips put together by Jeff Miami on Twitter. It's not the best quality, but nonetheless, it still is fascinating.
Take a look. Sanders movement is strong and it is uh, durable. And she has obviously got a lot of momentum, but they are not right now taking votes away from each other. And the problem is if you look at the cross tabs in this poll, Bernie Sanders starting to take votes away from Joe Biden. Yeah. And that is a problem for Joe Biden because he's got a lot of moderate voter, a lot of moderate candidates going after him. He's working but he's, but he's also voter. got a working class candidate from the left who's chipping away at some of his support. He's He's got a lot of issues coming from a lot of different people from a lot of directions. I'm stunned to see Bernie Sanders doing so well after he's been not doing so well. And I think that's an indication that we're not entirely sure where this is going to look you know, at Thanksgiving as opposed to when voting starts in February. I think it's such a smart point because it, it, oh, I always love the reminders of how much we miss. The national media misses so much of what happens on the ground for these campaigns and these candidacies. And while the Sanders campaign isn't all sort of above ground. There, there is sort of a, a, a movement. I was surprised to see him tied with Warren and Biden. It's, it's important to point out that this poll has a five to seven point margin of error. Uh, Biden campaign pushing back vigorously against its findings. David Jolly, your thoughts? Look, you've got to put this in the context of Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina. And Elizabeth Warren's in a very good spot in Iowa. She very well might overtake Biden. I think for Bernie Sanders, it comes down to New Hampshire. And as things fluctuate, we don't often talk about Bernie Sanders because his numbers always kind of stay the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has a very loyal constituency. But as Biden falls, all of a sudden Sanders is now in range. Warren and, and Sanders have a real competition in New Hampshire. And I think whichever one comes mm -hmm. out on top in New Hampshire is looking very good to be the foil to Joe Biden. I don't like. There's. It's hard to war game all this out. But I'll say. I'll say two things. One is, if you're Joe Biden, I don't care how big the margin of error is to be losing that kind of altitude in a respectable poll like this has got to make you a little bit nervous. Especially since you built your whole campaign on the premise of I'm the electable one. I have the area of inevitability. Once that starts to get chipped away, you start to see those downward numbers. It's that becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. The other thing, to your point, Nicole, is that people have made a fundamental mistake with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Everybody puts them in the same bucket. They're the left wing. They're the progressive part. They are not com gathering the same voters. Bernie Sanders' coalition is a down, is a middle class and down coalition. Her coalition is a upscale college coalition. Mm -hmm. They are definitely both on the progressive side, mm -hmm. but by and large, it is not the same coalitions those two are putting together. And they could both go very deep into this nomination fight because the Sanders movement is strong and it is uh, durable and she's obviously got a lot of momentum but they are not right now taking votes away from each other so I haven't said this in a really long time but um good job MSNBC <laughs> I mean you see just constantly them basically doing pro Biden propaganda Kyle Kalinske covered a segment that they ran where they talked about all of Joe Biden's gaffes and included uh Claire McCaskill and she basically said well look Joe Biden may be a gaffe machine but you know, we understand what Joe Biden is saying and trying to say. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but I mean, up until this point, they're all about Joe Biden, but now they just can't really do that because Joe Biden isn't necessarily this powerhouse that they thought he was. And, you know, this poll indicates that maybe he's the house of cards that progressives were saying he was. Again, could be an outlier, but we need to see Joe Biden's numbers plummet. And this poll is the first indication that they are, in fact, plummeting, not just steadily declining, but plummeting. Because if you see a double digit drop from June from the same polling outlet, that is absolutely just devastating and crushing, I'm assuming, to, you know, Joe Biden's team. I'm sure that they are terrified. So some of the things that they acknowledged here that Biden is having his votes taken away from Bernie Sanders because as, you know, Joe Biden's support base jumps ship, it seems like they're going to Bernie, which again is weird. I did a video on this talking about why that may be the case. And largely, I'm chalking this up to name recognition, but I mean, what <laughs> Joe Biden is losing, Bernie's gaining. And him and Liz, they just don't have the same support bases. And one of the pundits said it best, Bernie's coalition is a middle class and down coalition, and Warren's coalition is an upscale college education. So wealthy whites love Warren, and poor voters, um, also including communities of color, voters um, from all different demographics love Bernie Sanders. So you really do see this true rainbow coalition with Bernie, and that's great. Now, um, I love that they actually admitted to here that national media misses everything, and um, they finally acknowledged that Bernie has been polling in second place. 
And uh, someone even said, I'm stunned Bernie Sanders is polling so well. I mean, how do you miss this? He's consistently been in second place. He was in first place until Biden entered the race, and then he fell to second. And then you see this surge from Warren where she kind of overtakes Bernie in certain polls. But still, when you look at aggregate polling data, Bernie is in second place. So the fact that they dismissed him doesn't necessarily tell me that they care about the numbers. They just want to downplay Bernie. So they hope that this will kind of, you know, be reflected in the polls where voters will think, oh, well, you know, Bernie must be going down because that's what I hear from mainstream media. So they have an agenda. But when the numbers change so drastically as we're seeing from this Monmouth poll, it's kind of difficult to dismiss it because you just look like a hack. And they already look like hacks, but you don't want to appear that you're biased and you have an agenda to just normal voters who don't necessarily follow politics as closely as you or me. So overall, this surge is absolutely just such good news. And I'm trying not to get my hopes up too much because you never want to put too much stock in one poll, but just gauging the noise that this poll made, you know, in political discourse, in national corporate media, it tells me that this could be a continuing trend. So I'm hoping, I'm crossing my fingers that this is signaling a brand new trend where we see Bernie and Warren overtake Biden. And then as progressives, what we do is we shift away from Biden and we start focusing on the differences between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, because the differences are many. Warren may be a solid candidate, but she's flaky on Medicare for all. She's awful when it comes to foreign policy. And then we just need to convince people that it's Bernie who you want because he's the person who is saying very clearly that I want to change the system and not just tweak it. That's what Warren wants to do. So um, it'd be nice to just have this be a race between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and us not have to focus so much on Joe Biden. And that's what the polls are showing. So I'm going to watch this closely, really look at the next couple of polls, the next two to three polls that come out and see if the results from those polls kind of mirror what we're seeing here in this Monmouth poll, because then that will tell us that this is, in fact, the start of a new trend, which will be great news. So um, all around, if you're a burner, today's a good day. Bernie Sanders sat down for an interview with Crystal Ball of The Hill TV, and he explained why he recently paid a visit to Kentucky, and it is to put pressure on Mitch McConnell. Now, he also gave us a little bit more insight into what he would do to pressure McConnell, assuming he remains the Senate Majority Leader, if Bernie Sanders is elected president. Take a look. Why did you want to come to Kentucky? For a very simple reason. I happen to believe in democracy. I happen to be a member of the United States Senate. And there are enormous challenges facing this country and the world. And I'm here in Kentucky because Mitch McConnell, the senator from Kentucky, happens to be the majority leader of the United States Senate. Now, McConnell can vote any way he wants on an issue. But what I find really outrageous and extremely undemocratic is his obstructionism and his refusal to allow major legislation to come to the floor for a debate and for a vote. So essentially, while enormous problems face this country. Everybody knows it. There's very little that's going on in the Senate. It is a do-nothing body, and that is because of McConnell. And I came here to Kentucky to ask the people of this state to demand that their United States Senate allow real debate on the floor so that we can begin doing something to represent working families. So he proudly calls himself the Grim Reaper because he kills any and all democratic legislation that comes to the floor. He also recently wrote an op-ed saying that we should keep the filibuster in place. Um, what's your view on the filibuster? Well, let me talk about the Grim Reaper. I mean, and all that he is talking about is that we are seeing some decent legislation, not as strong as I would like, but some decent legislation coming from the House uh, in terms of raising the minimum wage to a living wage. That would be a profound, have a profound impact on the state of Kentucky, which, as you know, is a poor state, a lot of low-wage workers in this state, and that you have a senator from Kentucky who is refusing to bring a bill passed in the House to the floor is really an insult to the working people of Kentucky. And that's true for gun safety legislation. It's true for legislation trying to protect the integrity uh, of our elections from interference from Russia and other countries. Uh, in terms of the filibuster, I believe we need a strong filibuster reform. I don't think that some staff member can send down a message, uh, a note that says we're going to be required to have 60 votes. If you want to have 
a 60 vote margin, you want to filibuster, get on the floor and talk. I did it for eight and a half hours some years ago. That's what you can do. So I don't believe the Senate should be the House. But I do believe in strong uh, filibuster reform. And also, I think, on major, major issues like Medicare for all, which I intend to get passed if elected president, uh, we can do budget reconciliation and other uh, provisions, other ways to get that through with a majority vote. To me, I think this is one of the most important questions for you and for other presidential contenders. If Mitch McConnell is still in charge of the Senate, how do you get your agenda passed? Well, I'll tell you how. Uh, you do what has historically always been done when real change takes place. And that is you do what I've done today, except coming back as president, we could do it with a little bit more force. And that is speak to the people, state by state, and have them understand what their senator is doing. In my view, the vast majority of the people in this state of Kentucky want to raise that minimum wage to $15 an hour. And if McConnell happens to be, and I hope he will not be, and I'll do everything I can to prevent that, but if he happens to be to stay on as majority leader, I will be back in Kentucky to talk about the need to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, the need to guarantee health care to all people. And I think when you rally the American people, not just in Kentucky, all over this country, around an agenda that works for working people, you're going to be putting enormous pressure on those elected officials like McConnell who consistently represent the wealthy and the powerful against the interests of the people in their own states. So what Bernie Sanders is doing here is he's going above and beyond what other politicians are willing to do because they'll make these tweets about Mitch McConnell, they'll publicly denounce what he does, but nobody actually goes to Mitch McConnell's home turf and campaigns against him. Now, for those of you who don't know, Mitch McConnell is actually up for re-election in 2020. So currently, to go to his home state and make noise about why he's not representing his own constituents, that really is powerful. As Crystal Ball pointed out, Mitch McConnell is the self-proclaimed grim reaper of any and all progressive policies. But really, you know, it's not just progressive policies that he's killing. He's killing any and all policies. He won't allow a vote on pretty much anything. The House passes something, he won't even allow a vote on it, even if he knows that he has a majority. Republicans control the Senate, so they're most likely going to vote down whatever they don't like that is sent to them from the House, but he still just won't allow it. He is literally stopping democracy unilaterally. So Mitch McConnell is one of the biggest threats to democracy currently. He may be a bigger threat than Donald Trump, although that's arguable. But what Bernie Sanders is essentially doing is he's saying, look, Mitch McConnell is not going to continue to make a joke of our democracy. He's not going to be able to get away with blocking legislation and not allowing a vote. If he does this when I'm president, I will show up to Kentucky and campaign against him and have his own constituents call and put pressure on him. Now, it's not a sure bet that that strategy would work, but really, if you are the president of the United States, you are in control of that bully pulpit. You really could make a difference potentially. Now, I really hope that Bernie Sanders extends this strategy to members of his own party. If he's elected president, you're going to have to put in time. It's not just Mitch McConnell who you're going to have to put pressure on. You're going to have to put pressure on the centrist, mealy-mouthed, spineless corporate Democrats who are going to fight you on issues like Medicare for All, student loan debt cancellation. Although Donald Trump did just use his pen to cancel student loans for um, disabled veterans. So hopefully Bernie Sanders would pursue that route as well. But for whatever you know policy Bernie cannot pursue via executive order, the strategy should be replicated. I mean, politicians should be doing this. If all progressives make noise in this way and put in that extra step to campaign in the home states of politicians, Mitch McConnell, Democrats and Republicans, if we do this, this really could be a huge national movement where we do see shift because if you don't get money out of politics, they are not going to budge. So, of course, the end result is to remove money from politics entirely. But until we get there, we are going to have to do things like this, you know, campaign in their home states. Now, one thing that Bernie Sanders said here, I do disagree with. He says that when it comes to the filibuster, he doesn't think that it should be eliminated. Now, I don't agree with that. I think that the filibuster is just, at this point, 
Republicans, they've nuked the filibuster, so we have no reason to arbitrarily impose rules on ourselves if we reclaim the Senate, we meaning Bernie Sanders and Democrats, when Republicans are willing to do that. So why should we impose rules on ourselves that Republicans don't impose on their selves? To me, that just feels like asymmetric warfare, and it's just inherently unfair. Although, I do kind of give Bernie credit here and can give him a pass because even if he doesn't believe that the filibuster should be eliminated, he is open to filibuster reform and he did state that he would use something like budget reconciliation to pass policies like Medicare for All. If you expect to get Medicare for All while not getting rid of the filibuster, it's not going to happen. I mean, you're just not going to get 60 votes for something like Medicare for All. You'd be lucky to get 51 votes for Medicare for All, you know? So um, the fact that he is open to passing big policies in some way, be it budget reconciliation or filibuster reform, where he just needs that 50 plus one majority, that's good. Although I really would like to see him be bold here and just agree that we should be getting rid of the filibuster full stop because Republicans are the ones who decided that, you know what, maybe the filibuster shouldn't exist now that we have power. So I see no reason for us to limit ourselves. But back to the overarching point about Mitch McConnell, Bernie Sanders here is showing everyone why he is a real leader. He's not just going to do politics as usual in the sense that he'll tell someone from the House or the Senate to propose legislation and then it'll be vote on and then either it passes or it fails but that will be the end of the story. No, he's actually going to fight for what he's proposing, which you need, because if you honestly expect to pass anything that is bold or a sweeping reform of whatever type, you're not going to get that done just by, you know, the usual legislative procedure. That's just not going to happen in this day and age when we are incredibly polarized. You have to crack skulls. And Bernie Sanders thus far is the only politician that is communicating to me that he will be doing that, that he gets that. And that's important. And that's what really sets himself apart from people like Elizabeth Warren, who makes it very clear that she's a team player and, you know, she's on Team Democrat. And, you know, if they disagree, well, that's fine. She's not going to push them too hard. No, I want an outsider who isn't part of a team who's going to say, you're going to follow my lead. And if not, then I'm going to campaign against you in your own home state. That's what we need. We have to be aggressive because... We don't have a choice. The planet depends on it. The American people depend on us being aggressive and being relentless as we advocate for these policies that would substantially help people and change and save lives. So Bernie Sanders unquestionably has the right idea and we need him to be elected so that way he can implement this strategy and then other future presidents who are democratic Will replicate this strategy because I have no doubt that this has a chance of being successful. I'm not going to say it's going to guarantee that Mitch McConnell will buckle, but at least when you put in that extra time and effort, it's more pressure than he would usually face, something that he's not necessarily used to. Because if you're shamed in your own home state, if people turn against you in your own home state, guess what? Your political career is done. And Bernie Sanders understands that, and that's why he understands the importance of taking it a step further and traveling the country, not just remaining in D.C. if he's president. That's why I support Bernie, because I want someone who's going to fight. And time and again, he has reassured me as a supporter that he will fight if he's elected. Slowly but surely, the primary field is starting to thin. And based on polls that we've seen recently, it's becoming increasingly clear that we could see a race between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren because Joe Biden is continuing to plummet um, and it just seems like the race is going to come down to Bernie Sanders versus Elizabeth Warren. Now, if you watch the mainstream media, which you should not, but if you do, there's this underlying assumption that if you support Bernie Sanders over Elizabeth Warren, it must be because you are a uh, sexist. Few pundits will say this explicitly, but this is something that is implied. You know, they try to prime you to think about it in this way because the idea is, look, if these candidates politically are virtually the same, why would you opt for an old straight white male when you can elect the first woman president? And while I agree that the goal of electing a woman president is important, 
the number one priority is not gender or identity. It is about the policy substance. And to the chagrin of mainstream news pundits, if this race really does come down to a battle between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, we will make it very clear that Bernie Sanders is different than Elizabeth Warren because they're different with regard to policies. Bernie Sanders is much better when it comes to foreign policy. Elizabeth Warren is, quite frankly, terrible when it comes to foreign policy. But it's not just the policies that differentiate these two candidates. When it comes to just having political courage and politics, Bernie Sanders is much different than Elizabeth Warren. Because I don't need to rehash what happened in 2016 when she demonstrated to us that she lacks political courage. She's more ideologically aligned with Bernie Sanders, but she didn't endorse him. She waited until the primary was over, and then she was one of Hillary Clinton's biggest cheerleaders. Now, I get that, you know, you're campaigning for Hillary Clinton because you want to defeat Donald Trump, that's fine, but you could have had the candidate be the nominee with your help that would have went on to defeat Donald Trump, but you wanted to be her VP. So you made a political calculation that ended up backfiring and it led to you losing support among progressives. But that's not the only time when she demonstrated that she has no political courage. Uh, when the water protectors at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation were being assaulted by militarized police, Elizabeth Warren said nothing. She was silent and she didn't speak up about that until after the issue was pretty much over. So there's problems with Elizabeth Warren. And one of my biggest issues with her is that she is a quote unquote team player where she's made it clear she's committed to the Democratic Party and she's not an outsider. And, you know, she's not going to blow up the system in the same way that Bernie Sanders will. Now, it's evident that even if the media would like you to believe that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are the same. There's a very important reason why Third Way is saying a lot of nice things about Elizabeth Warren. There's a reason why Wall Street executives are communicating that, you know, they'd be more open to Elizabeth Warren than Bernie Sanders because they realize that there really is a difference between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And there's an article from the New York Times that really highlights that key difference. And this is in the way that they campaign and their campaign strategy. Bernie Sanders is relentless in saying, I am with the American people, the forgotten people. He's a real populist, unlike Donald Trump. But Elizabeth Warren, she's saying, I'm with the people, but I'm also with the elites. Because according to this article from the New York Times, here's what she's quietly telling elites in the Democratic Party. As Jonathan Martin of the New York Times reports, this is the overall point she's been trying to make. While her liberal agenda may be further left than some in the Democratic establishment would prefer, she is a team player who is seeking to lead the party, not stage a hostile takeover of it. As Miss Warren steadily rises in the polls, she is working diligently to protect her left flank, lining up with progressives on nearly every issue and trying to defuse potential attacks from supporters of Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont. I'm with Bernie, she responds when asked what is perhaps the most contentious issue of the primary race, Medicare for all. Yet publicly, and even more in private, she is signaling to party leaders that far from wanting to stage a quote political revolution in the fashion of Mr. Sanders, she wants to revive the beleaguered Democratic National Committee and help recapture the Senate while retaining the House in 2020. Miss Warren's wooing could prove important should the nominating process deadlock at the Democratic National Convention next summer. Many of the officials she is courting are so-called superdelegates who are able to cast a binding vote should the primary go beyond a first ballot. So this is incredibly telling. And this highlights one of the key differences between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. She is a team player who's seeking to lead the party, not stage a hostile takeover of it. Now, a problem with that is the Democratic Party, the DNC, it is fundamentally broken. It's run to the core. So to say that I'm a team player. When your team has been losing, when your team is going down the tubes, when your team is so incompetent, they lost to a fascistic demagogue like Donald Trump. That's not a team that I want to be a part of. That's not a team that I am proud to represent. So if you truly were a team player and you wanted to remain committed to this idea that you're a team player, 
then ideally what you would say is, look, I'm going to lead the team in a new direction, but she's not saying that. And during an interview with Jen Uger of TYT, when the issues with Joe Manchin were brought up, she mounted what she called a, quote, spirited defense, unquote, of Joe Manchin. I want to I want to make a spirited defense that there are folks like Joe Manchin. He works hard on issues that affect working people in West Virginia. Sure, Jan. So it doesn't matter how horrible the Democrat is, they have a D next to their name, so they matter. They're important, according to Elizabeth Warren. When they're part of the problem, too, the system itself has corrupted both parties. Capitalism, like a virus, has infected both parties. So if you are saying that, you know, I'm all about my team winning and the other team losing, you're missing the point. You're missing the forest for the trees. And that is why Elizabeth Warren is nowhere near as good as Bernie Sanders, because Bernie Sanders is saying... I'm coming in as an outsider, and I'm not going to change the rules of the game. I'm going to blow up the game. So Elizabeth Warren, she doesn't want to do that. She wants to make a few substantial tweaks around the edges, but she doesn't want to fundamentally change the system in the way that Bernie Sanders wants to do it. Because she knows that she can't really fundamentally change the system you know, given the current Democratic Party status quo, if you say we're no longer going to take corporate PAC money, if you say we're going to do Medicare for all regardless if members of the party leadership like it or not, you're basically going to war with your own party. And Bernie Sanders has made it clear that he's willing to do that, whereas Elizabeth Warren is not wanting to do that. She is a team player. And that's the problem that we have with Elizabeth Warren. You're buttering up the elites when Average voters hate them. We don't like the Democratic Party. Most people identify as independents, so we're not on Team Democrat, Elizabeth Warren. Contrary to popular belief, we don't like them, we hate them, and we want you to change the entire system, including the Democratic Party's infrastructure, because they are fundamentally broken, and we want you to be so bold, so progressive, that if somebody doesn't want to change within the Democratic Party, they flee the party, and they join Republicans where they belong, and your response to that is, c'est la vie. But it doesn't seem like Elizabeth Warren wants to do that. And in the event, let's say she were president and she proposed Medicare for all and Democrats like Joe Manchin threatened to leave the party. She is someone who I could honestly see would change that policy and water it down just to make it more appealing to people like Joe Manchin. Because that's the way that she has governed. And that doesn't necessarily mean that she has a bad record, right? Her record is fairly progressive. She has one of the better records. But just in terms of who do you want as president, who do you want fighting for you, the answer is clear. It is Bernie Sanders. Now, here's the thing about her strategy. When it comes to buttering up elites, it does seem like that's actually working. And it may even be giving her the edge over Bernie Sanders because individuals within the Democratic Party who should theoretically side with Bernie Sanders or have sided with him before, they're actually opting for Warren this time. So, for example, Raul Grijalva was Bernie Sanders' first congressional endorsement in 2016 when everyone else was lining up behind Hillary Clinton like good little soldiers Raul Grijalva said, you know what, I'm going to shun, you know, that Democratic Party orthodoxy and I'm going for Bernie Sanders. But this time he flipped and he did not endorse Bernie Sanders. He endorsed Elizabeth Warren. Deb Holland, who was one of the first two Native American women elected to Congress in 2018, who campaigned as a bold progressive, she got elected and then she voted for Pego. And then she recently voted to condemn BDS, right alongside corporate Democrats and Republicans. And now she has endorsed Elizabeth Warren. And Deb's endorsement for Elizabeth Warren is actually obviously pretty controversial because Elizabeth Warren embarrassed herself with the DNA test debacle. And not only that, she didn't say a single word while members of Standing Rock Sioux were being brutalized by militarized police, as I brought up earlier. So they were fighting to protect their sovereignty. They were fighting to not allow the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline to violate their rights to clean drinking water. And Elizabeth Warren remains silent. So I understand why Deb Holland's own constituents are saying, wait, really? You're going to endorse Elizabeth Warren? What? So understand, Elizabeth Warren is winning over a lot of party elites because, quote, she is a team player who is seeking to lead the party, not stage a hostile takeover of it. So that's why they like Elizabeth Warren. That's the key difference between her and Bernie Sanders. And it's part of the reason why Elizabeth Warren is not as good 
as Bernie Sanders, period. Now, besides her attempt to butter up elites, here's what she's also assuring to the establishment, because they've been reaping praise on her lately, which is interesting, right? Because if somebody is truly progressive, you should be attacked relentlessly by the establishment. You know, the mainstream news pundits, they should be pouncing on you. You should have third way running attack ads on you, but that's not happening. And it's because Elizabeth Warren has been putting in the work to butter them up. So here's what she's promised them. While Miss Warren has been careful to avoid directly criticizing Mr. Sanders, her regular references to being a capitalist withstanding, she is also quietly taking steps within the party to make clear that she does not want to create a competing power base should she become president. She was one of the first Democratic candidates to sign a pledge circulated last month by the Association of State Democratic Committees vowing not to create any parallel political or organizing infrastructure that would compete with the national or state Democratic parties. The same pledge, which was shared by a Democratic official, also includes a promise to share all of my data collected during the presidential campaign with the DNC and the state parties. The state leaders were trying to ensure that the eventual nominee would turn over his or her fundraising list and any voter file that was compiled for future races. More broadly, they also wanted to ensure that the nominee's political organization is housed within the architecture of the party. So it's clear why this pledge exists. Part of it is probably, you know, Obama's organizing for action, but it's obviously because Bernie Sanders refused to turn over his email list, which we did not want him to turn over his email list because I don't want my email being given to Democratic Party elites who are going to fundraise when they've betrayed me, when they don't represent me. So look, this really is the difference between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And I hate to break it to Warren, but while you may be one of the better candidates in this race, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're better than Bernie Sanders or anywhere near Bernie Sanders in the same league as Bernie. Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are very, very different. So if this were just a normal election, if we weren't going up against Donald Trump, if there wasn't this healthcare crisis, if climate change wasn't going to kill us all so soon, I'd say, you know what, Elizabeth Warren is a fine candidate. Her more gradualistic, incrementalist approach, it's going to suffice. But we're not in this time. We need a figure who is going to be transformative, like FDR, like Reagan, but on the left. And Elizabeth Warren has made it crystal clear she is not that transformative figure. She's proposed some great, bold policies. But time and again, she has reiterated I'm on Team Democrat. I'm not going to fundamentally change the system. I'm a capitalist. Bernie's not saying that. Bernie's saying we need a political revolution. And guess what? He's right about that. Because anything short of a political revolution where we change the status quo is not going to cut it. It's just not. We can't have another president who's going to follow the usual legislative process where policy is proposed and then either it's passed and signed into law or it dies in the House or the Senate and then that's that. No, we need someone who's going to be a fighter, who's not just going to fight Mitch McConnell and the Republicans, but who's going to fight their own party, go to war with their colleagues if they don't get on board with these policies like Medicare for All that we need. So Elizabeth Warren, she may be a good candidate, but she is no Bernie Sanders, and we may never get the opportunity to elect a politician like Bernie Sanders again, certainly within our lifetimes. And even if she did have the courage to change the system, she's made it clear that that's not what she wants to do. So she may be a solid candidate. She may be a great ally to Bernie Sanders and progressives sometimes, but when it comes to who we should elect as president... We have to have a political revolution. We have to have a figure who's transformative. That's not Elizabeth Warren. This article makes that crystal clear because currently she's buttering up elites when she should be going after them, like Bernie Sanders, when she should be approaching reform from the outside, saying, no, you know what? If you're not with me, then you're against me. Elizabeth Warren is not that kind of a politician. She's a team player. And unfortunately... Her team is corrupt and garbage, which is why we have to elect Bernie Sanders, someone who's going to change the system and make it acceptable to be a team player on the Democratic Party again. Because currently, as they stand now, they are atrocious and they are not 
representative of the people. Everything that they stand for is against the interests of the American people. It's in favor of the donor class and elites. So that's why you can't be a team player. And anyone who's saying they're going to be a team player, they're essentially telling you that they're not with you. They're with the elites. So listen, I don't like to criticize people who are allied with Bernie Sanders, but unfortunately, we have to be real here. I'm a realist. Elizabeth Warren is no Bernie Sanders. Donald Trump is completely and utterly just exhausting. I mean, the amount of stupidity spewed from him, it's just so exhausting. I mean, every single day, he says something that is either factually incorrect or something so stupid, so beyond the pale, that you just can't help but be turned off by him and want to shut down and not even pay attention to what he's doing because the man is a moron. He's communicated to us time and again that he doesn't know anything about anything. His brain is obviously melting out of his ears. He's mentally deteriorating. His cognitive capacity is basically that of a child. I, I don't know what else to say about Donald Trump at this point. If you're still following him, if you still think that he is this, you know, strategic mastermind and you know he's not really stupid he's just saying all of this to distract you or he's playing four-dimensional chess i don't know what to tell you donald trump says and does stupid things because donald trump is a stupid person now the latest thing that he said according to jonathan swan and margaret Talev of axios President Trump has suggested multiple times to senior homeland security and national security officials that they explore using nuclear bombs to stop hurricanes from hitting the United States. According to sources who have heard the president's private remarks and been briefed on a National Security Council memorandum that recorded those comments. During one hurricane briefing at the White House, Trump said, I got it, I got it. Why don't we nuke them? According to one source, who was there. They start forming off the coast of Africa as they're moving across the Atlantic. We drop a bomb inside the eye of the hurricane and it disrupts it. Why can't we do that? The source added, paraphrasing the president's remarks. Trump also raised the idea in another conversation with a senior administration official. A 2017 NSC memo describes that second conversation in which Trump asked whether the administration should bomb hurricanes to stop them from hitting the homeland. A source briefed on the NSC memo said it does not contain the word nuclear. It just says the president talked about bombing hurricanes. The briefer was knocked back on his heels, the source in the room added. You could hear a gnat fart in that meeting. People were astonished after the meeting ended. We thought, what the F? What do we do with this? Yeah. How do you not just laugh at him if he seriously suggest this like if he's being facetious and he's saying, why don't we just nuke the hurricanes? Ho ho. That's a totally different story, but he's being serious here. He's literally suggesting that we nuke hurricanes to stop them. This is basically idiocracy. That movie was not supposed to be a documentary. It wasn't supposed to be a prediction. It was just supposed to be entertainment. But Donald Trump is that movie personified. When the president couldn't figure out why all of the crops across the country were dying because they started uh, using Gatorade to water the plants... That's Donald Trump in a nutshell. He is that movie Idiocracy personified. Because, I mean, how else do you explain this? He's literally, seriously saying, why don't we stop hurricanes by nuking them? I mean, how stupid do you have to be to think that that's a solution? Just on its face, it's so insane that any reasonable adult who has two functioning brain cells that are working would just laugh at that. But this is the president, the man with his finger on the nuclear button, who is literally saying, hey guys, what are we doing? Why haven't we nuked hurricanes yet? The shit, like, literally gives me a headache. Like, Trump is making me physically ill to deal with this stupidity. Why can't we nuke hurricanes? I mean, I, I honestly don't know what to say. I'm speechless. Now, to be fair, Trump is not the first person to promote this idiotic idea because a government scientist back in the Eisenhower administration had previously floated this idea. Hey, 
Maybe we can nuke hurricanes and stop them that way. And ever since that was floated, the idea has kind of taken up a life of its own, and idiots thought it was so brilliant that till this day, they can't let it go. And it's become such a prominent idea that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration literally had to address this on their fact page, explaining that there is no evidence suggesting that a nuclear bomb could alter a storm at all, but most importantly, the resulting radioactive fallout, obviously, that would spread pretty quickly, would make matters exponentially worse fast. And the fact that this has to be explained to people is embarrassing, but I mean, it honestly, like, I shouldn't be too shocked because we are living in an era where flat earthers, chemtrail conspiracy theorists, and anti-vaxxers are all, like, gaining popularity, gaining ground. So, I mean, this probably is the least crazy out of all those ideas, but nonetheless, it's still an idiotic and childish assumption to even think that bombing a hurricane would work at all and not cause more damage, even if it could get the hurricane to dissipate. I mean, what do you think would happen? Do you think that we'd be okay if the hurricane goes away, but then there's that nuclear fallout that poisons all of us? I mean... <laughs> The amount of stupidity to say that not once but twice, it honestly is, it's unfathomable. If Donald Trump can become president, you clearly can do whatever you want to do in life. It's possible. So, um, well, actually, not if you don't have money. But nonetheless, I mean, still, being that stupid and becoming president is really, it's just... It's remarkable. Now, in response to this story, Donald Trump, of course, denied it because we're all making fun of him, and he tweeted, The story by Axios that President Trump wanted to blow up large hurricanes with nuclear weapons prior to reaching shore is ridiculous. I never said this. Just more fake news. Now, one thing that's interesting to me about this is he referred to himself in the third person, presumably so he can say this was a staffer that said it, but then he goes on to say in the next sentence, I never said this. So now he's just like going out of his way to more frequently refer to himself in the third person. I mean, who is not sick and tired of Donald Trump? Like, if you are a supporter of Donald Trump, how are you not just exhausted at this point trying to defend everything that he says, trying to chalk up his idiotic gaffes to him playing 4D and 5-dimensional chess? I mean, how are you not sick of him already? Politically speaking, he fires up the base, but I mean, he's not delivering anything. He is leading us into potentially another recession due to his idiotic trade war with China because he doesn't know how to handle this situation like a grown-up. There's something wrong with you if you support him. You have to have something not working right in your brain to think that this man should remain president. The fact that he was elected in the first place is an embarrassment to all of us, but to still support him till this day when he is declining mentally rapidly i don't i don't know what to say to you you just you have to have something wrong with you like and i know that that sounds condescending it sounds smug but the man is a moron how do you not see it if you can't see that he's a moron then there's something wrong with you that means that you must be intellectually dim as well if you don't see what everyone else sees in an interview with Crystal Ball on The Hill TV, Bernie Sanders was asked about UBI being a potential solution to an increase in the rise of automation, and his answer didn't go over too well with one of Universal Basic Income's biggest champions, Andrew Yang. So we'll hear what Bernie Sanders had to say, and then I will tell you Andrew Yang's response. Uh, I believe in a uh, jobs guarantee. There are an enormous amount of work uh, there is an enormous amount of work that has to be done all the way from child care uh, to health care to education to rebuilding our infrastructure to combating climate change to dealing with our growing elderly population. Enormous number of jobs out there. And I believe under a Sanders administration what we would do is create those jobs and as people lose their jobs there will be other jobs available. But bottom line is we cannot allow robotics, technology, artificial intelligence to simply throw people out on the street. Technology has got to benefit all of us, not just the heads of large corporations. Why is a federal jobs guarantee better than a universal basic income? I will tell you why. Uh, a simple reason. I think most people want to work. They want to be a productive member of society. I think it's a very deeply ingrained uh, feeling that people have. They don't want to sit on the side. Yes, of course, 
getting a guaranteed income is better than having nothing and sleeping out on the street, that's for sure. But I think people want to be part of, you know, part of our humanity, to be truthful. And how we feel good about ourselves is when we are productive members of our society. We're contributing something. Uh, and I think people feel that very strongly. And I think there is more than enough work to be done in so many areas. And our job is to say, if you are able to work, we have a job for you. Because the truth is, we have so much work to do to rebuild this country in so many ways. Now, here's what Andrew Yang had to say about that. He tweeted, Bernie ignores the facts that money in our hands would one, create hundreds of thousands of local jobs, and two, recognize and reward the nurturing work being done in our homes and communities every day. He also assumes that everyone wants to work for the government, which isn't true. He added, it's very strange. He seemed open and warm to the idea of a universal basic income not too long ago. Now he seems irritated every time it comes up. So my initial reaction was that this is kind of an overreaction from Andrew Yang, because I don't really feel like what Bernie Sanders had to say there was that problematic. Like, it didn't seem like he was trying to attack UBI. And furthermore, like, it didn't seem like Bernie Sanders was even irritated there. So I'm not sure why Andrew Yang was so angry with what Bernie Sanders had to say. And I also don't believe that Bernie Sanders is ignoring how beneficial it would be to increase purchasing power of Americans, because Bernie Sanders, he talks about this all the time. And when Bernie Sanders says that people want to work, he's not necessarily saying that they want to work exclusively for the federal government, but what he's saying is that people enjoy working. They like doing things. I mean, when I was on unemployment, when I lost my job, I was bored. Like, within a month, I felt desperate. Like, it was nice to get a little bit of a break, but, I mean, I was ready to go back to work because I, I wanted to do something, right? People genuinely want to work. And one thing that I think that Andrew Yang and Bernie Sanders is missing here is that both a federal jobs guarantee and UBI, these are not mutually exclusive things. Like, you actually can have both, and I support both simultaneously to a degree. Now, I will say that when it comes to Andrew Yang's argument for UBI, when he does say that, you know, UBI would reward the nurturing work of mothers or fathers who stay at home and caretakers and whatnot, I do think that that actually is a really persuasive way to sell UBI. However, it seemed really out of character for him to kind of go after Bernie here. But here's the thing, I do believe that Andrew Yang, to a degree, is kind of overselling UBI because look, don't get me wrong, $1,000 per month would be phenomenal for a lot of families. But do you honestly believe that that's an end-all be-all? Like if we just give every single American $1,000 per month, or in the case of Andrew Yang, you know, if you're already getting food stamps or welfare, you have to choose between that and $1,000 per month. If we just give everyone $1,000 per month, is that honestly going to solve all of the country's problems? No. Now, to be fair, Andrew Yang doesn't actually suggest that this is the case. However, he doesn't talk about the other policy proposals that he has. He kind of just remains committed to this idea that universal basic income will solve so many problems when in actuality, it's not going to solve that many problems. Again, it would be great, but it's not the end all be all. What do you honestly believe would be more beneficial? Giving every single person $1,000 per month, which adds up to $12,000 per year, or guaranteeing everyone a job that pays seventy, eighty thousand $80,000 per year and provides them with union uh, benefits, stability, and whatnot? I mean, the answer is obvious. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that if you support a federal jobs guarantee that you can't be in favor of UBI. I actually do support a UBI that supplements our existing social safety net because if you create this UBI that can one day replace our current social safety net, we're not making ourselves any better off. So you don't want UBI to be implemented in a way where it can be used as a Trojan horse. Now, when I brought Andrew Yang on my program, I asked him about this and he told me, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, I wouldn't want social safety net programs to be cut. He basically made it seem like I don't want UBI to be a Trojan horse to gut our social safety net. However, when he went on Rave Dubin's show, he said basically the opposite, that, you know, UBI could potentially act as a replacement to welfare programs one day. I've talked to people who are on various welfare programs, and they love the idea of getting $1,000 unconditional because they dislike the case manager, the reporting requirements, and everything else. And so you can reduce the enrollments in our existing programs significantly 
Uh, and so, and it brings down the headline cost very quickly because if someone's already getting $700 in benefits, then the cost is $300 instead of $1,000. And even if he has adjusted his UBI program so individuals on Social Security don't have to choose between UBI and their Social Security benefits that they paid into, still, if you are making somebody choose between welfare and UBI, then that's not truly universal because somebody who is on food stamps and is poor, they're not technically getting, you know, that extra $1,000 per month. They're having to choose, whereas somebody who makes $100,000 per year and isn't on welfare, they don't have to choose. So, you know, someone who's better off, they just get an extra $1,000, you know, no questions asked, whereas someone who's poor does not get that, you know? So what's more important and what Bernie Sanders communicates more so than Andrew Yang is that we need to change the system, UBI alone isn't going to fix the economy, and I don't necessarily think that Andrew Yang thinks that that's true as well, but what do you think is more important? Changing the entire system, restructuring our economy, or giving everyone $1,000 within our existing system, and just saying, all right, that's good. I mean, that's not a very sufficient long-term solution. And look, again, I think that they're both wrong in the sense that you don't have to choose between UBI and a federal jobs guarantee. You can technically have both of them. You can have your cake and eat it too. But if you are going to choose between one or the other, which is the implication here that both of them believe, then obviously you want something that will increase purchasing power more. And that's going to be a federal jobs guarantee. Like $12,000 a year isn't going to be enough for people to survive. Of course, that's not going to be enough. So, you know, you need to make sure that people are guaranteed a good paying job where they can have union membership. So to just say, you know what, UBI is better than a federal jobs guarantee. I think you're kind of missing the forest for the trees. And you can also argue that maybe Bernie Sanders is being a little bit too dismissive of UBI here. But if I had to choose, which it's, you know, it's kind of a false choice, a false dichotomy here, I would still say that the federal jobs guarantee long term is more important. But that's not to say that UBI wouldn't help. I just don't really get why Andrew Yang is um, criticizing Bernie Sanders here. Um, there are genuine good faith critiques of UBI and Bernie Sanders, he didn't seem irritated here. So I, I just don't really understand this here. Um, you can be in favor of both. If I were, were Andrew Yang, I'd say, all right, you know what? I'm going to outflank Bernie from his left. I'm going to propose a federal jobs guarantee and UBI that isn't a replacement for our social safety net. It supplements our existing social safety net. But I mean, I don't know. Andrew Yang, he's a good person, right? He is a smart guy. I think he's a genuine person. This seemed out of character for him to go after Bernie there because Bernie Sanders really, I mean, if he criticized UBI, it was a tepid criticism at best. Now, if Andrew Yang were to say, look, Bernie, if you support a federal jobs guarantee, that's fine. But if you're not also supporting UBI, here's why you're wrong. That would make more sense, but for him to just make it seem as if, oh, well, you're wrong if you don't support UBI in lieu of a federal jobs guarantee, just long term and looking at the bigger picture, that doesn't make sense. A federal jobs guarantee would do more for people than $12,000 a year. Bigger picture. Fixing the entire economy is more important than giving people, you know, $1,000 per month and not changing the system. The goal, number one priority, is to change the system. Bernie wants to do that. Andrew Yang wants to make some tweaks around the edges, which is why I support Bernie Sanders over Andrew Yang. As many of you know, right-wing billionaire David Koch has recently died. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I am just completely, you know, upset and taken aback by this, as you can tell. No, but seriously, let me explain something to a lot of right-wingers who are taking this badly. One, I think they're upset because they're losing one of their main sugar daddies, but they're clutching their pearls because liberals are explaining why this was a very bad person. I mean, if climate change ends up killing everyone and the planet becomes uninhabitable and human beings go extinct, David Koch in large part shares the blame. He's not solely responsible, but he certainly is largely culpable for that because that's the legacy that this individual leaves behind. And dying doesn't just suddenly make people good. Like if you lived your life as an evil human being who caused harm to not just communities, but to the planet, 
I'm sorry, because you die, that doesn't mean that we have to handle you with kid gloves and say nice things about you. No, if you were a bad person, then we need to be realistic and evaluate your legacy that way. And as I alluded to, David Koch was a horrible person. I mean, he funneled billions of dollars into organizations that promoted climate change denialism. And he did this because he knew regulations to mitigate the damage that climate change would cause would cut into his company's profits potentially. So as Tim Dickinson explained in this 2014 piece for Rolling Stone, Coke Industries were some of the biggest polluters in the world. He bought off politicians that killed unions. He contributed to conservative organizations that fought against LGBTQ and women's rights. They fueled much of the astroturf elements of the Tea Party movement in the early 2010s. This is someone who was an absolute monster. So forgive me for not really caring as conservatives clutch their pearls when the left points this out. If you're a bad person, we're not just going to pretend like you were a good person to make other people feel better. I mean, his family has billions of dollars, so I think that they're going to be okay. But I mean, the pearl clutching is just par for the course. That's what conservatives do. They call the left snowflakes, say that we're hypersensitive, and then whenever something happens that offends them, then they denounce that and say that we're being overly sensitive. Ben Shapiro did it. Pretty much everyone did it. And it's because, you know, David Koch and the Koch Network, they had their hands in every single cookie jar. How many people are funded by the Koch brothers. Even Dave Rubin sold out and started taking Coke money. So everyone loves the Cokes because the Cokes, I mean, they spent a lot of money buying people off. Now, an example that really stood out to me of pearl clutching came from Sean Hannity, who didn't like what Bill Maher had to say about this. Now, look, I don't like Bill Maher. I can't stand him, to be frank. But Bill Maher's reaction to David Koch's death was pretty reasonable. So, this is what Sean Hannity said in response to Bill Maher's reaction. All right, our villain of the day, yeah, it's a guy named Bill Maher. This is what he said about, well, billionaire David Koch who passed away. Yesterday, David Koch of the zillionaire Koch brothers died, please, of prostate cancer. I guess I'm going to have to reevaluate my low opinion of prostate cancer. <laughs> So f him. The Amazon is burning up. I'm glad he's dead, and I hope the end will I have a little message for Bill. You know, I never called for his firing. It's conservatives who stood up for him when he worked at ABC, not liberals. Uh, I never called for boycotts. I'm not going to start now. You're a jackass. You're a mean-spirited jackass. I have other words I really want to use, but... Unlike you, I work at a network that has some standards, and if I said it, I have to spend all day tomorrow and the next day dealing with that crap. The guy you're talking about and his wife donated $1.3 billion to charity. Until you do that, just keep your big mouth shut. Ooh, ooh, we have a special snowflake! I absolutely detest anyone who makes the respectability and civility argument, but if there's anyone who I think should say the least about this, it's definitely, definitely Sean Hannity. One of the most loathsome people, biggest hypocrites in all of politics. Now he says, I'd never call for boycotts, and I wouldn't call for Bill Maher to be fired. Although, if somebody happened to start a petition, I wouldn't be too mad about that. I mean, that's essentially why he brought that up. He's not bringing this up to communicate to people that he's principled, because he's not principled. This is someone who's a hack. He's pretty brazen about his hackiness. I mean, he has a very close personal relationship to Donald Trump, so he's not objective. He's not fair and balanced. If he actually cared about freedom of speech and was principled, he would condemn the movements that aim to criminalize BDS. But I mean, this is someone who's nothing more than a right-wing fraud. He denounces handouts. Meanwhile, he doesn't tell you that the government helped him get his real estate business jump-started. So this is someone who has absolutely no room to talk about hypocrisy, no room to talk about pretty much anything. Sean Hannity is the fraud of all frauds, and he's probably one of the biggest bad faith actors in all of cable news. Now, he says to Bill Maher, you're a jackass. You're a mean-spirited jackass. I have other words I really want to use, but unlike you, I work for a network that has some standards. <laughs> <laughs> Fox News has standards. 
Well, what are these standards, Sean Hannity? Explain to me what these standards are. I mean, <laughs> the fact that he would have the audacity to say this is just absurd. Just because you're number one in all of cable news, that doesn't necessarily mean that Fox News does good work. Fox News is the worst thing to happen to journalism in perhaps the history of our country because they are pure propaganda. And that's not to say that CNN and MSNBC aren't bad, but the fact that you think that Fox News is somehow better than them when you are exponentially worse, it shows how delusional you are. And he also recited a line that a lot of other conservatives are using to defend David Koch. The guy you're talking about and his wife donated $1.3 billion to charity. Until you do that, just keep your big mouth shut. Oh yes, don't criticize David Koch because he was such a huge philanthropist and all the headlines stated this too. Okay, this is something that you shouldn't be bragging about. His net worth was $42.4 billion. So the fact that he only donated $1.3 billion is actually embarrassing. Especially considering the fact that he weaponized his philanthropy. And that was likely tax deductible, let's be real. And he did that to spread the Coke name, to have departments and universities named after him. He did that to give himself and his brother cover so they can continue to ruin the planet. But anytime someone criticizes him, Hacks and propagandists like Sean Hannity can defend him by saying, well, look at all of the great contributions he's made to cancer research. I mean, to suggest that the charitable contributions that David Koch made would somehow erase the damage he's caused is laughable. Maybe, you know, Sean Hannity at some point in his life did something good. Maybe he gave five bucks to a homeless person. That one individual act doesn't say anything about his overall character. It's just one instance of him choosing to do something good. But the thing about David Koch it's, is it's not like we even know for sure that he was motivated to make these contributions out of the goodness of his heart. These were weaponized contributions because again, he wanted to shield himself from criticism because he was being criticized because he's kind of fucking up the planet. So Sean Hannity, I mean, the fact that you are going to say this, act so triggered and outraged by Bill Maher, and then probably a week from now, you'll do a segment about how college campuses and students on college campuses, rather, are so triggered and outraged by everything, and they're the PC police. I mean, there's just there's a certain set of standards that the right will apply to the left that they don't hold themselves to, right? So they can be as outraged, as easily offended as they want to be. And that's not hypocritical. But any instance of left-wing hypersensitivity, understand that they will be the first to call that out immediately. So whenever you hear a right-winger talk about how easily offended the left is, show them this clip of Sean Hannity. Show them the clips of Tommy Loren denouncing people who kneel during the national anthem. Show them the tweets of Candace Owens who claims somebody should literally lose citizenship if they choose to desecrate a flag. I mean, there is no shortage of snowflakery, right? At the end of the day, Sean Hannity is a complete and utter joke and the only types of people who take him seriously are people who are completely either low information voters or genuinely have something wrong with them mentally. Surprise, surprise, Fox News is attacking Bernie Sanders again, and this new round of attacks comes after he introduced a fully fleshed out Green New Deal proposal. So I anticipated these attacks, but what is surprising to me is just the sheer level of laziness in the way that they're choosing to attack him because they're not even trying to attack him in an intellectual way. Like, they're just trotting out the same argument that they used before that wasn't very persuasive then, and it still isn't very persuasive now, but essentially what they're trying to say is Bernie Sanders must be a hypocrite because he has a carbon footprint, but also cares about climate change. And it's just, it's, it honestly is baffling that they still think that this is a persuasive line of attack. Take a look. Bernie Sanders getting called out on the campaign trail after rolling out his $16 trillion Green New Deal. Turns out the socialist is a bit of a hypocrite, though, when it comes to climate. Watch. You seem adamant about climate change. Yep. Of course. So what ways would you take to practice what you preach if you were to become president? No, I'm not going to walk to California. All right, you know. 
Look, you know, I understand that. You know, we, we do the best we can as an example, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we're not going to use fossil fuels. I'm not going to tell you I'm not going to get on a plane. That would not be true. I mean, it, it seems like people like Bernie have a higher threshold, Martha, when it mm. comes to, you know, walking the walk. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when I watched that moment, it reminded me of when we did our town hall with Bernie Sanders and it had just been announced that he made over a million dollars on his book. And I asked him, you know, you say that millionaires and billionaires should pay more in their taxes. So would you volunteer, you know, to, to walk the walk to say, you know what, I should be paying more right. because I am now a millionaire. What did he and say? He, I forgot. He, you know, he, he, he was mean, first of all. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, why don't you pay more? And I said, well, I'm not running for president and oh. I'm not advocating any of the things that you're that you're talking about. About, but why why wouldn't you so he doesn't like to be pressed on these uh, these issues no. that he claims to feel strongly about and that was another example you can tell you're right that that is his biggest weakness when you accuse him of hypocrisy he gets very defensive well first uh, bernie better call up the obamas because they just purchased a 12 million dollar mansion on the coast <laughs> now if you listen to the dems that coast will not be there in 10 years so does uh, the obamas know something that the dems don't that it's all bs which stands for bernie sanders <laughs> the thing is the secret to being a progressive is to be on top because if you're on top then you can enforce your beliefs without ever having to adhere to them and then when people come after you you can be like de blasio and you go well look, you know what i got everybody else to obey and to sacrifice, which allows me to go to the gym in, Brook in Brooklyn <laughs> right. with an entourage or with Bernie to own three homes and fly private or first class. Yeah, well, that's like that Bill too. Maher. He can root for a recession because he can he, he can wait out a recession with his money. Well, I remember when Beto's tax returns or financials came out and, and people said, well, why haven't you donated more to charity since you come from a very wealthy family? And he essentially said, well, I am the gift. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I am the gift and oh. I'm running for Public president service. to do the most day. good. And people like Bernie Sanders want to control every type of industry so that the little guy has to come and beg them for whatever it is that they need. He's the guy that said that bread lines in Nicaragua were a good thing, right? I mean, but he's the one who's They're definitely good standing there. in those I lines, heard. right? Is that right? No, that's oh. not true. Well, <laughs> no, I'm just, that was a joke. Very bad. <laughs> you know, I listen to you too much. Uh, you probably uh, but, should. But I must say, I must, I'm so curious because it seems to me that when I look at the people who are backing Donald Trump, the big donors, they're on top. And they seem to be but putting their money it away into Donald else. Trump. Donald Trump is doing great with the big, with the Steve Rosses and all. And the little people. donors. Well, so 60%. Far, he's doing a little better. But you know what? You look at the money that comes from PACs, Greg, you, the, the so-called dark money. Oh, he so, has a huge lead in this. But to get back to Bernie for a second. All of you, I think, are not understanding that Bernie is not playing small ball. He's talking transformational politics on issues that the Republicans have nothing to say about. Then he will be the nominee, say, as I predicted. But I don't know. You see, I don't know that <laughs> Democrats feel confident that he won't be easily portrayed. He calls himself a socialist. And, and what does Trump want? A, He's a stronger candidate than, than, than energy-wise than Joe. You know, Juan, yeah. the yeah. way that you change behavior, especially when it comes to pollution and the environment, is to do it on an individual level. And if someone like Bernie Sanders can't name one possible thing that he's willing to cut back on when he's telling everyone else we're going to tax the, you to the, out the wazoo, tax the middle class, sue the oil companies, completely take over the government with the oil companies for no crime that they've committed, and yet he's not willing to say one thing he's willing to do. So I don't know what that town hall participant said because for whatever reason, Fox News conspicuously edited out what he said, and I couldn't find the original clip, but let me just respond to that individual by saying, first of all, there is no ethical consumption under capitalism, and second of all, Climate change cannot be solved at the individual level because 100 corporations emit 70% of greenhouse gas emissions. So you can personally choose to go vegan. You can personally choose to start biking to work. But that's not going to save the planet. We need government action here because climate change is an issue that is interconnected. When the planet's temperature increases, this affects a multitude of different things. This isn't just about driving. This leads to desertification, ocean acidification. This has political ramifications. This could lead to mass migration, areas of the planet becoming uninhabitable. The Middle East, for example, would be too hot for people to survive. Areas of the country being flooded being underwater permanently, potentially. Florida, for example. So for you to say, oh, you know, if I just choose to make better decisions as a consumer, that's going to save the planet. 
One, that's not reasonable to expect people to do that. And two, even if every single person, even if 100% of us at the individual level did that, as I stated, not going to save the planet. So if you make this argument, it just tells me that you're not clever, you're not smart, you're uneducated about this issue, period. Now, they also decided to liken what Bernie Sanders said about flying and air travel to him not wanting to raise his own taxes. So one of the hosts on the table there, she co-hosted Bernie Sanders town hall. And she said, look, I asked him about this. I said, you're a millionaire. Why don't you volunteer more taxes? That is such a dumb argument. First of all, it doesn't work that way. Bernie Sanders can't just send the IRS an extra check and say, here's some extra money. Teehee. I love paying taxes. Like nobody loves paying taxes just for the sake of paying taxes. Nobody writes a check to the IRS because they like the way it makes them feel. The reason why Bernie Sanders is saying that we should increase taxes on wealthy people, including himself, is because we expect something in return. Raising his taxes to help fund Medicare for All is something that's valuable. Just needlessly giving the IRS more money when you know that that's going to be used to bomb children in the Middle East and North Africa. What point does that serve? The point of increasing taxes on the rich is to have that money go towards things that help people. So that's just an idiotic thing to say and to claim that that's hypocritical. I mean, that's so disingenuous, and she claimed that Bernie Sanders was mean in his response, but I mean, look, you asked a stupid question, so you should expect a stupid answer. Now, here's what one of the hosts said. Bernie wants to control every type of industry, so the little guy has to beg them for whatever it is that they need. This is the guy who said that breadlines in Nicaragua are a good thing. So first of all, Bernie Sanders has not advocated that the government be in control of every type of industry, but if we're being honest here, that's more preferable than private companies being in control of every single industry. So I mean, for example, healthcare. You don't want private companies delivering healthcare to us because there's a conflict of interest. They care more about making money, increasing profits, increasing shareholder value. So to say that in all instances, you know, I'm just, I'm hyper-capitalist, we should never allow the government to be involved. Well, it, when it comes to healthcare, at least, just that's just one example, who would you prefer to be in charge of that industry? The government who answers to the people, who is accountable to the people, or private corporations who is accountable to no one, whose board members we can't elect. I mean, I think the answer is pretty obvious. You can make the case that maybe, you know, when it comes to fashion and clothing and video games, that can be up to private companies. But I mean, she, this is someone who's not, you know, a good faith actor. She's just trying to smear Bernie Sanders. Now, I want to give you the full context about that quote that she cited because she keeps bringing this up. This is the actual video of what Bernie Sanders said when he was asked about bread lines in Nicaragua. You know, it's funny, sometimes American journalists talk about how bad a country is because people are lining up for food. That's a good thing. In other countries, people don't line up for food. The rich get the food. Now, to give you some additional context here that she conveniently left out um, or doesn't know about, Bernie Sanders is not suggesting that we should have people in this country be so impoverished so, you know, economically um, disadvantaged that they have to line up for bread that's provided by the government. That's literally the opposite of what he wants. Like, he wants us to have economic independence. He wants to increase our purchasing power. But in the context of the way he was talking about bread lines, is he was saying governments should be responsive to the needs of the people. And a government in a highly impoverished country that is at least trying to offer bread to people, that's better than a government that just says, you know what, starve. So context absolutely matters. He's not saying, like, are you honestly saying that Bernie Sanders wants us to be as bad as Nicaragua where we have to have these bread lines? Of course not. He's talking about need. He's talking about the delivery of goods and services. He's talking about being responsive to the needs of the people. So for you to twist that is incredibly nefarious and disingenuous, but this is one of the dumber Fox News hosts, and you're going to see that. So as usual, Juan Williams, he was the only reasonable person on the panel, and he said Bernie is talking transformational politics on issues that the Republicans have nothing to say about. Now here's where she chimed in, and she almost made my head explode. You know, Juan, the way that you change behavior, especially when it comes to pollution and the environment, is to do it all 
on an individual level. Oh my god, you moron. Have you, like, read anything about climate change and climate change mitigation and adaptation? Do you know anything? Do you even believe in climate change, for one? But, I mean, do you honestly believe that, one, all Americans would be willing to make these changes at the, at the individual level? And even if they did make those changes, do you honestly believe that that would suffice? Of course not, because we're talking about large multinational corporations that pollute the fucking planet. Get that through your thick skull, dummy. We're not talking about the climate changing and becoming uninhabitable because a bunch of people are polluting the water that we drink and pumping greenhouse gases into the air from their fucking Xboxes. We're talking about large multinational corporations that cut corners and pollute the planet to increase profits, you dumb fucker. How do you not get that? God, Fox News hosts, like, I hope... That she's just being disingenuous. I hope that she's just lying through her teeth. Because if you're that stupid, then you absolutely should not be on national television espouting whatever nonsense you believe. Because it's just fucking dumb. Like, I, I know I'm being a dick, but I, I can't help it. Like, the planet is on the cusp of becoming uninhabitable for us, right? So for you to suggest, oh, well, you know, let's all just do better, guys. Come on, let's reduce our carbon footprints individually. That's not realistic. You need a government and governments, plural, to come together and address this issue. The United States is the biggest country militarily, economically, so we can easily be a leader here. But Donald Trump is an imbecile. He doesn't even believe in climate change. So what Bernie Sanders is saying is, I'm going to make us a world leader. I'm going to make sure that we have a Green New Deal that doesn't just make us a world leader when it comes to green renewable technology, but it pays for itself within 15 years. It brings other countries together, creates a fund for developing countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And guess what? We could potentially save the planet this way. We change the way our economy functions. But this Fox News host... Um, since she's getting paid, I'm assuming six figures, would rather lie about that. It's just, it's disgusting. Now, here's where she really shows all of her cards here. She says, Bernie Sanders can't name one possible thing to cut back on when he's telling us he's going to tax you out the wazoo, tax the middle class, sue the oil companies, completely take over the government with the oil companies for no crime they've committed, and yet he's not willing to say one thing he's willing to do. But wait, didn't you just contradict yourself? Because you're saying, oh, Bernie Sanders wants to do all of these things and sue fossil fuel companies, but yet he's not saying a single thing that he wants to do. You just cited some of the things that he wants to do. Now, part of that, you know, was you lying, but he wants to do something. But of course, you know, it has to be at the individual level, because if you're a Fox News host, you know, that's the only thing that you can say that would be acceptable to Fox News' right-wing advertisers and the bosses over at Fox News because you're supposed to pretend like climate change is um, a hoax or, at best, it's real, but, you know, the climate is just always changing. So that's all it takes, though, right? Why didn't we think about this sooner? Individuals could have solved this climate crisis a long time ago. I guess that the indigenous tribes in the Amazon could just choose to not have their homes destroyed by private corporations. I guess that we can choose to not create large multinational corporations and pollute the planet ourselves. Done. I mean, what are you saying? We have, what, 11 years to act, to take drastic action, to stop a climate catastrophe, and there are still people on Fox News who have no sense of urgency whatsoever, and they're still promoting this harmful idea that at the individual level, that's the way that we solve climate change. This is a micro-level issue and definitely not a macro-level issue, so you should probably stop pressuring lawmakers to impose more regulations on these companies that are polluting the planet and just, you know, choose to not pollute the planet yourself. Uh, you know, recycle more. I mean, this is just downright dangerous now. Like, I would love to say this is just Fox News stupidity, so let's laugh and point the finger at them and make fun of them. But I mean, we're in crunch mode. We have 11 years to potentially stop climate catastrophe and save the planet. So this, this can't stand. Anyone who's saying this at this point in time is a danger to the world. Is a danger to the world. And I don't think that that's being hyperbolic.
We recently talked about how under Jair Bolsonaro's leadership, deforestation of the Amazon rainforest is up 80% in comparison with last year, which is absolutely horrifying considering that the Amazon rainforest is largely known as the lungs of the earth. Now, in response to this increased brutal deforestation of the Amazon rainforest, Germany threatened to cut 35 million euros in aid if Jair Bolsonaro didn't, you know, pump the brakes a little bit. And his response to Germany was essentially, all right, that's fine. Don't need your money if there's going to be stipulations. So this individual is becoming one of the most dangerous people in the world because what he does in Brazil doesn't just affect Brazilians. It affects everyone on the planet. Now, about a week or so, I think less than a week, in fact, after we talked about Jair Bolsonaro, and how deforestation has accelerated under his leadership, well, as you all know, the Amazon is currently on fire. It's on fire, and Jair Bolsonaro, even though he deployed Brazilian troops to help fight the fires, he's made it very clear that Brazil does not have the resources needed to fight these fires. And since this is an issue that affects everyone, French President Emmanuel Macron called it an international crisis, and... He recommended, reasonably so, I think, that this is something that should have been discussed at the G7 summit. But because Macron recommended that global leaders address this very serious issue, Bolsonaro accused him of having a, quote, colonial mindset that was inappropriate in the 21st century, which is essentially the international equivalent of the weaponization of identity politics. So this is peak stupidity here. I mean, to say that... Another leader taking an interest into what's happening in your country, if it affects the world, is having a colonial mindset. That's just, that's so stupid. I don't even know how to respond to that. And in true Trumpian fashion, what Jair Bolsonaro decided to do next was attack Emmanuel Macron. So a user on Jair Bolsonaro's Facebook page posted a meme comparing Macron and Bolsonaro's wives, essentially saying, look at the both of them, Macron is probably jealous, and Bolsonaro responded jokingly by saying, don't embarrass the guy. So let's just take a step back and reflect on what's happening. Jair Bolsonaro is mad that Macron had the audacity to recognize the international importance of of the burning of the Amazon rainforest. So uh, he decided to attack Macron's wife for that. Now, I would love to tell you that that's the most craziest part of the story, but it's not. Because on Monday, Emmanuel Macron offered millions of euros to Brazil to help them fight the fires. And after Bolsonaro said, we don't have the resources to fight this, Guess what he did? He rejected the money that Macron offered. Now, thankfully, he hinted that he'd be open to change his mind, but, I mean, he already rejected aid from Germany. So, of course, like the petulant child that he is, he would also reject the aid from France. So, he's worse than Donald Trump. Donald Trump may actually literally be more mature than Jair Bolsonaro, which is almost unfathomable, but the Amazon rainforest, the Earth's lungs, is on fire, and Jair Bolsonaro is getting into these petty fights with world leaders who want to help. What an idiot! Now, Donald Trump himself, his hands aren't clean as well, because he is the president of the United States, but he's another idiot. He doesn't even believe that climate change is a thing, and as the leader of our country, he could say, maybe we should do something about the fact that the Amazon rainforest is burning. Maybe, Brazil, you should accept the aid from Germany and France. But he's not doing that. Now, we heard from a real leader and what this individual would do in the event he was president, and here's what Bernie Sanders said he would do to put pressure on Brazil in this situation when... We have to act. If you were president today, how would you pressure President Bolsonaro to I cut would out use those very fires? strong carrots and very strong sticks. I mean, you know, as, as people have said, uh, the rainforest uh, in the Amazon is the lungs of the of the planet. Uh, they are absorbing carbon dioxide. They are 
producing oxygen. You destroy that, you impact not only the people of Brazil, but the people of the entire planet. And we as a planet, I mean, you know, you have a president who literally thinks, uh, shockingly, that climate change is a hoax. If I'm elected president, I will lead the world as, as the leader of the most powerful nation on earth, bring countries together to understand that this is not an American issue, it's not a Brazilian issue, it's not a German issue or a Russian issue. We have got to go forward as a planet to transform our energy system. We are in it together. We are tied together. And we have got to, got to, got to transform our energy system. And I think when we do that, by the way, we can create many millions of jobs, not only in this country, but throughout the world. But would, what's going on in Brazil right now... Would you consider sanctions? Absolutely. Absolutely. What is going on in Brazil is extremely dangerous. And I think, as many people know, uh, the new president over there is a Trump acolyte. I mean, this is somebody who looks at the world the way Trump does, and that is very, very frightening. So I think uh, we would use all of the tools at our disposal, the carrots and the sticks, the punishments and the inducements, uh, to try to make sure that we stop the burning of the Amazon. And in fact, we work with the entire world uh, to move forward to protect the planet. And that is exactly what I would expect a leader to do. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. And if Brazil is going to act petulant, if Jair Bolsonaro is going to reject aid from other countries after saying Brazil itself can't fight these fires, then you have to take action. You have to take very sometimes, you know, aggressive action and impose sanctions. Now, I know what people will say, you know, sanctions aren't necessarily the best route. It's too aggressive. And, you know, sanctions oftentimes can hurt people. But here's how I respond to that. First of all, you can target the sanctions in a way so it limits the impact on people. But overall, we don't really have a choice. We have one planet. We have one planet. And in the event our planet is destroyed and it becomes uninhabitable, guess what happens? We can't move to Mars. We can't live on the moon. We die. So we don't have a choice. We have to be aggressive. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that we go to war with Brazil over this, but I'm saying we need a leader who will take action, who will put pressure on them. Because this is something that doesn't just affect Brazil. This affects everyone. And if you're worried about the pain that putting pressure on Brazil via sanctions would potentially cause, think about what is happening currently in the Amazon rainforest. There are indigenous tribes who are losing their home, all because Jair Bolsonaro thinks more and more of the Amazon rainforest should be privatized. And this is what's happening to indigenous people as the Amazon rainforest burns and Donald Trump sits idly by and does nothing. They're watching their homes vanish before their very eyes. The Guayapi tribe have been the stewards of these waters and the land that caresses it. In return, the Amazon rainforest has given back with every drop and seeds safeguarding their livelihood, tradition, and ultimately their survival. Nós aqui moramos dentro da pulmão da Amazônia, né? Porque essa Amazônia traz saúde para gente, né? Saúde para muito, assim quer dizer. Essa a é no mundo, né? A poluído traz muito problema para gente, problema de saúde, tristeza. Por isso que nós preocupamos se mudança de climática, né, quer dizer, né? Essa é que nossa preocupação nós exige da manhã pi. But the isolated YAP, 1500 strong across 92 villages in Amapá state say they've never felt so under threat as they do today. And it seems not even the demarcation set by Brazil's 1988 constitution can protect them. That is now perilously close with President Jair Bolsonaro calling for protected and demarcated sections of the Amazon to be opened up to roads, ranching, farming and mining, arguing this demarcated area is too large for the indigenous and is hindering development.
On the ground, the YIP tell us they have already begun to feel the impact of his words and policies. This government is massacring our rights and our indigenous people. With garimpeiros, wildcat miners, loggers and ranchers invading and assaulting their land. Já estão iniciando, matando os povos indígenas e nós não queremos nenhuma gota de sangue mais. Audio provided to Brazilian journalists just after their chief was killed on July 22nd shows their urgency for action. A facada, várias furadas no, no corpo dele e no pênis dele e mataram muito feio. But they say the savagery didn't stop there. He entra numa numa casa indígena, vai agredindo as crianças, agredindo mulheres. They may be shaken, but the YAP are not running scared. Instead, in silence, they ward off evil spirits and ready for battle. No, 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 no. That's just, it's tragic. Now, let me remind you that this is all happening while Donald Trump sits idly by and says and does nothing because corporations have got to make money. So that's more important than allowing these indigenous people to keep their homes. Capitalism is literally killing the planet because we have prioritized the profits of private companies above not just indigenous people and their lands and sovereignty, but over the entire planet that we live on. I mean, I don't even really know what to say about this. This is maddening. This is absolute lunacy. And I don't care what Jair Bolsonaro has to say. If he thinks that world leaders trying to help is colonialism, if he doesn't like that people are interested in the affairs of Brazil, too bad. Because what happens in Brazil, what happens in the Amazon rainforest affects all of us. So for you to just sit idly by and allow it to die and burn to the ground and not accept the help from you know world leaders because you're too petty, because maybe something that they said or worded in, in an improper way to you was off-putting or offensive, get over it. Because we don't care about your feelings, Jair Bolsonaro. We care about the planet. So, I mean, the rise of these Trumpian figures, it couldn't have happened at a worse time. I mean, the rise of fascism, it's never welcome. We never want to see these far-right demagogues spring to power like this, but the fact that it's happening now when we need to take swift and drastic action to combat climate change, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's just, it's devastating to see this happen. Just a few weeks ago on the show, we talked about how one of CNN's fact checks of a Bernie Sanders claim made about healthcare spending ended up blowing up in their faces when it was revealed that they made that same claim themselves previously. So it's obvious that they're being overly nitpicky on Bernie Sanders and they're looking for reasons to discredit him. We talked about that CNN fact check fail on the program. I'm going to show a really quick snippet just so you kind of get the gist of what happened. So CNN politics tweeted fact check. Bernie Sanders is once again saying the U.S. spends twice as much on health care per capita as any other country in the world. It's a claim he has been making since at least 2009 when PolitiFact noted that it was false. It's still false now. And when you go to the article, they claim again that he's been making the same false claim for 10 years now. Now, here's why they say they rated this claim false. Facts first. It's still false now. The U.S. does spend the highest amount on healthcare per capita of any organization for economic cooperation and development country, but not double every single one. So the issue isn't necessarily that he was lying. The issue is that he wasn't being specific enough, because even if we spend double many countries when it comes to healthcare spending, we just don't spend double every single country. 
So the word every is really what's at issue here. It's a little bit misleading. And here's how they say he could have been more correct. Sanders could have accurately said the U.S. spends more than twice the average for OECD countries, which was an estimated 3,992 in 2018 and a firmer 3,854 in 2017. And what I love is that Bernie Sanders actually responded to this, and it's in the actual article. And he says... Actually, we were referring to the average for OECD countries and noted that this was confirmed by CNN, who in January of this year published an article with the headline, U.S. spends twice as much on healthcare as its peers. So in short, CNN rated one of Bernie Sanders' claims false after they had previously published an article where they essentially said, the exact same thing. Now that's the Cliff Notes version. It's an oversimplification. I will link you to that full video down below because there's more to it. And we kind of go into why they specifically say that Bernie Sanders was incorrect. But that same thing just happened again. But this time, instead of CNN doing it, the Washington Post did it. Now, David Dole covered the story in such a thorough and phenomenal way that I'm going to share his video with you and just again a really quick snippet and then when we come back i'm going to tell you the aftermath of that story because to say that this also blew up in the washington post's face would be an understatement because i think that this makes them look worse than cnn looked even bernie tweeted out 500,000 americans will go bankrupt this year from medical bills now this is citing a published study in the american journal of public health that says uh Medical bankruptcy is still common despite the Affordable Care Act. And they published this number. Actually, the number is even a bit higher, which I'll get to in a minute. But the Washington Post took issue with this fact that Bernie tweeted out, putting out this article saying, Sanders' flaw statistic, 500,000 medical bankruptcies a year, giving him three Pinocchios out of a possible four claiming that this is a classic case of cherry-picking a number from a scientific study and twisting it to make a political point. This study, before Bernie cited it, was widely, widely cited by a number of outlets. A number of outlets, including the Washington Post themselves. So this article <laughs> from February... The Health 202, Utah is trying to roll back Medicaid expansion plans on a shaky assumption. 530,000 families deal with bankruptcies related to illness or medical bills. The Washington Post cited this same statistic themselves. Now, if you haven't watched David's full video, I would encourage you to pause this video, go watch that video first so you kind of get the full context because the story is a lot crazier than that. Like he goes into all of the details, I'll link to it down below. It's just, it's a, it's a mind blowing story. Um, and I, I can't believe that the Washington Post would even publish that after they published the same thing themselves. And David just does such a phenomenal job breaking it down. But the point is, these fact checkers at two different outlets now, they proved that they're not being objective. They're just trying to discredit Bernie Sanders because they're probably banking on the fact that most people will see that headline and not go any further, not read the article itself. And then they'll just think, oh, well, Bernie Sanders is a liar. He lied about this claim with regard to healthcare spending, and now he's lying about this claim about medical bankruptcies. He must just be like Donald Trump. So it's really disgusting, um, and it's almost like the mainstream media hates Bernie Sanders, and he's right about there being a bias against him. But the way that this story blew up in the Washington Post's face is so embarrassing because the author of the study that they cited here, Dr. David Himmelstein, literally contacted the Washington Post and demand that they issue a public retraction. That's how bad he thought their article was. Now, again, I sound redundant, but author of the study is contacting them. Embarrassing. Embarrassing. But here's what he said. Dear Salvador Rizzo, this is the author of the Washington Post fact check article. Your Washington Post fact checker article falsely claimed that my article in the American Journal of Public Health had not undergone peer review. While some other editorials that appear in that journal may not undergo such review, as indicated in the email included below that I received from the editor-in-chief of the journal, 
Mine clearly did. Your false claim has besmirched my reputation as a scholar. I demand that you immediately publicly retract it and the rest of your article and that you pursue vigorous efforts to inform readers of your error. Now he attached a response from the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Public Health where he does in fact confirm that Himmelstein's paper had in fact undergone peer review. And in that article, what's mind-boggling to me is that the fact checker literally reached out to Himmelstein. Dr. Himmelstein responded and he said, Bernie Sanders largely described my study accurately and they still gave Bernie Sanders three Pinocchios. <sighs> They're just shameless. Now, the story doesn't end there because senior advisor to Bernie Sanders' campaign, Warren Gunnels, actually tweeted out Dr. Himmelstein's letter, which then prompted Glenn Kessler of the Washington Post, who was another fact checker, to respond saying, this is false. Article did not say it was not peer reviewed. We quote an editor saying the editorial did not undergo the same peer reviewed editing process as a research article, but note it used a methodology similar to what the researchers used in a 2005 peer reviewed study. Now Warren responded to that saying, Glenn, honest question. What type of peer review does your quote unquote fact check go through? The only person you could find to say Bernie was wrong is the former chief economist of a right wing think tank that represents fast food, tobacco and alcohol interests. Why didn't you mention that? And he then provided the receipts, of course. So I was genuinely shocked at that CNN fact check kerfuffle. But this one from The Washington Post is just exponentially worse because they say, you know what, Bernie Sanders? What you said here is wrong. We're going to give you three Pinocchios after one of the articles we published has the same headline saying exactly what you said. But in this fact check, we're going to reach out to the author of that study and then we're going to quote him in our fact check of you saying that what you said was correct and then still proceed to give you uh, three Pinocchios and then double down when that author calls us out. Jesus. I mean, Fox News would probably go a bit further in order to hide their bias, but the Washington Post now, this is just pure propaganda. I don't know what else to say about this. And here's what's sad about this. We shouldn't have to worry about fact checkers being biased because if you are going to fact check, you are supposed to be objective. You're supposed to be the most objective. We all have biases and a lot of times fact checks, you know, these fact checkers, they're going to have to make executive decisions based on their interpretation. But this is not one of those instances where anything is left up to interpretation. To fact check what Bernie Sanders said, they reached out to the author of the study he was citing, and he said Bernie's correct, and they still said Bernie's incorrect, and then doubled down after the author of said study called them out. This is madness. I mean, this is just so embarrassing. If we have to worry now this much about fact checkers trying to discredit Bernie Sanders, then it's no wonder why there is a crisis in trust in corporate media, because this is absolutely disgusting. And for them to then complain about Bernie Sanders calling out their bias and the fact that they're owned by Jeff Bezos, it makes the situation that much more ridiculous because just a couple of weeks ago, they were saying that Bernie Sanders was spreading conspiracy theories by suggesting that maybe the Washington Post was biased against him because it's owned by Jeff Bezos. And here they publish this fact check where they are going out of their way to give Bernie Sanders three Pinocchios when the author of the fucking study is saying Bernie's right. To take on the author of the study in this direct way to where he has to come out and demand that they issue a public retraction, this is a new low and it's, frankly, they should be embarrassed. But they're shameless. They have an agenda and for them to still tell us that that's not the case, it's as if they're pissing on our legs and telling us it's raining. No, you guys are absolutely biased. And if you didn't want us to call out that bias, then maybe tone it down a bit. Be a little bit less brazen in trying to just go out of your way to discredit Bernie Sanders in hopes that people won't read beyond the headlines. I mean, I'm still like I'm genuinely shocked by this. Um, again, if you haven't already watched David Dole's video, because the story is just so bizarre, so, so bad, even by the Washington Post standards, that it, enough can't be said about this. This is madness. So I don't even know what to say about Joe Biden at this point. We all know about the gaffes, 
But the gaffs have now transformed into these long sentences that I don't know how else to describe other than just pure word salad. My long friend, time friend, and she's a friend. She's been my friend in and out of public life. And on top of that, he forgot Barack Obama's name, very notably, um, on the campaign trail. Because they invaded another country and annexed a significant portion of it called Crimea. Right. He's saying that it was President, my boss, it was his fault. So Joe Biden's campaign has been an unmitigated disaster. And just on a human level, I actually feel bad for him. I feel bad because this individual clearly is not supposed to be running for president. You should be at home. Your mental capacity is deteriorating rapidly before our very eyes. You shouldn't be doing this. You should not be in the race. So just on a human level, I feel bad for him. But on the other hand, Joe Biden throughout his career has been a very selfish individual. He has taken positions that are awful for purposes of political expediency. And now, you know, even if I can you know, sympathize with him and empathize with him to a degree on a human level because of all of the horrible things that has happened to him throughout his life. Even though he is wealthy and he's a privileged former vice president, he's gone through things that are absolutely horrible that no human being should have to experience. He has, you know, witnessed the deaths of family members. So I feel bad for him because of that. But now it's to the point where he is using their deaths and politicizing them to argue against progress, to argue against policies specifically that would save lives and prevent future deaths. So, you know, put aside all of the gaffes and let's just look at Joe Biden's politics. He released an ad where, I kid you not, he is using the deaths of his family members and his son to argue against Medicare for All and attack advocates like Bernie Sanders of Medicare for All. This is absolutely disgraceful. Take a look and then I will show you someone who is in a similar situation as Joe Biden, what they had to say about this. I was sworn into the United States Senate next to a hospital bed. My wife and daughter had been killed in a car crash. And lying in that bed were my two surviving little boys. I couldn't imagine what it would have been like if we didn't have the health care they needed immediately. 40 years later, one of those little boys, my son Bo, was diagnosed with terminal cancer and given only months to live. I can't fathom what would have happened if the insurance companies had said for the last six months of his life, you're on your own. The fact of the matter is, healthcare is personal to me. Obamacare is personal to me. When I see the president try to tear it down and others propose to replace it and start over, that's personal to me too. We got to build on what we did because every American deserves affordable health care. I'm Joe Biden and I approve this message. That's so disgusting that you are trotting out your son's death as a political prop to say we shouldn't have the one policy that would eliminate deaths due to people not having health insurance. It doesn't get any lower than this. This is basically as low as it goes. This is gutter politics. And he equated what Donald Trump is doing in repealing the Affordable Care Act, chipping away at it, to someone like Bernie Sanders. And he didn't cite Bernie by name, but essentially he attacked Bernie and said he wants to start all over. Now, first of all, Obamacare was starting all over. Bernie Sanders is not starting all over. He is taking an existing political program, Medicare, which has a very high approval rating, and he's retooling that so there's no more gaps and then he's expanding coverage. That's not starting over. We are not saying that, you know, we shouldn't have Obamacare because we hate Obama. But what it seems like you're saying is that you just want to hang on to the Affordable Care Act because there's sentimental value there because Obama did it or uh, the, uh, uh, your boss did it, if you can remember his name. And it's just, it's so disgusting. Now, Amy Valella. She is an individual who lost her daughter because she did not have proof that she had health insurance. This is what Amy Valella had to say in response to Joe Biden using his son to argue against Medicare for All. I can imagine 
what it's like for my child not to have the health care she needed immediately. I had to hold my 22-year-old daughter as she took her last breath. I had to watch my children wail at her bedside. I had to be pulled away from her coffin. No middle ground, Medicare for all. And then she adds, Scott knows what it's like for his child not to have the health care his son Danny needed immediately. As a matter of fact, 30,000 Americans every year know what it's like to have their loved ones not have the health care they need immediately. People are dying. That's the reality of not having health care immediately. The only true solution is Medicare for all. And she included the image. This is the reality of having no insurance and for-profit hospitals. Shalin was a student who worked two jobs and had just moved to another state. She went to the hospital with every symptom of a blood clot and was told at an ER to go get insurance and see a specialist. They didn't even give her a medical screening, a right she had under MTALA. She left humiliated and continued working on obtaining insurance. Time was not on her side. Unfortunately, she died from a pulmonary embolism. Her life could have been saved with a simple, inexpensive test. No middle ground, Medicare for all. And on the show, we have shared Amy's story multiple times. And if you watched the documentary, Knock Down the House, she told her story, Shalin's story. So to see Joe Biden exploit his son's death, trot it out as a prop to say we shouldn't have Medicare for all. When his policy would allow for medical bankruptcies and deaths due to a lack of health insurance to persist, there's nothing to be said about that. Joe Biden is a disgusting cretin. Not only is he unelectable because his brain is melting out of his ears very much like Donald Trump. He doesn't have the cognitive capacity to run for president, but he's also not electable because someone who is willing to say that we shouldn't advocate for Medicare for all, otherwise we're somehow going against the legacy of his son, that's someone who is not qualified to represent the American people because they are so disgusting, so dirty, that they would use their own son's death to argue for a system that maintains the for-profit status quo where people do die due to a lack of health insurance. And sometimes they have health insurance, but they can't afford the deductible and they still either go bankrupt or die. So this is the lowest thing that Joe Biden has done in recent history. But, you know, this is par for the course with a corporate Democrat. These corporate Democrats are soulless. They are spineless. They have no core. They only care about getting elected. They only care about getting into positions that are powerful because they don't care about political ideology. They care about power. So that is disgusting. Shame on Joe Biden. He needs to drop out, not just because politically he's out of step with the base of the Democratic Party, but because it's evident that he does not have the capacity to run for president. Stay at home, Joe. Retire. Enjoy your life. You're wealthy and privileged enough to where you can live out whatever you want to do. The rest of your day is doing whatever. Stay out of the race because we absolutely don't want you and we certainly don't need your disgusting gutter politics in the 2020 election cycle. We've talked before on the show about Fox News' obsession with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and it's beyond the point where, you know, we can accurately classify their obsession with her as pathetic, but it's starting to honestly get a little bit creepy because now what they're doing is they are fishing through her Instagram in order to find a reason to attack her based on something that she said. So she had this Instagram live stream and she said the most benign, insignificant thing, um, most uh, uncontroversial thing ever, and they still tried to find some way to attack her for it and said that she was insulting the past generation when in actuality she was really just praising her own generation. But they didn't really know how to attack her. That was evident. So what this segment turned into was essentially them just bashing millennials. That's what this was. It was an anti-AOC segment that devolved into a millennial bashing spree. And then towards the end, they are going to reveal that all the problems that they have with millennials are actually applicable to them as well. Not even kidding. So everything that they say will be disqualified after they say, oh, well, you know what? This thing that I hate about millennials is also true for me. It's just, it's unbelievable. Fox News, I mean, to say that they're a joke is the understatement of the century. But let's watch, and then I have a lot to say. 
progressive darling Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is turning some heads in her latest Instagram Live video. The New York Congresswoman boldly claiming millennials and Generation Z are, quote, more informed and are, quote, willing to go to the streets in protest and are more well-versed in history. Ocasio-Cortez apparently forgetting about the civil rights movement and Vietnam War activism of the 1960s. Oh, and there's that conflict of World War II, the greatest generation that saved the world from authoritarian rule because of the sacrifice of teenagers. Here's Ocasio-Cortez. This is great. I think that... Um, they're badass. I think young people are more informed and dynamic than, than their predecessors. I think they're profoundly courageous because they're willing to puncture taboos and, conversa and have conversations that, frankly, older generations sometimes struggle to have. Hello, Brian. Yeah, they took to the streets to <laughs> celebrate buff. victory against fascism and Nazism. Same thing. Took to the streets when, uh, uh, when they were actually trying to fight for our freedom. And they actually did take to the streets in the Depression to get food. So that was lining up in a soup, uh, in soup lines and bread lines. So it's unbelievable that the people at Boston University must be just cringing, holding their heads under the desk right now. She graduated and feels she's part of the greatest generation. Hey, our military is as good as it ever is. But as a, right now as a society, there's a reason. Uh, if you watched the D-Day celebration and you saw who fought and what was at stake, I, uh, you'd be embarrassed. I can't by believe it. you're dissing the millennials, Brian. I'm yeah. so offended uh, right now. Well, I think millennials <laughs> should stand up and defend the greatest generation. No, I completely agree. <laughs> Look, there are a number of uh, people in our generation who have done amazing things. The people who joined the military after 9-11, that was a defining moment of our generation. Uh, people in the tech industry, Mark Zuckerberg, who created Facebook. I know there's a lot of questions and problems with Facebook, but it changed the world. Um, but this idea that we're going to say that we are better than the greatest generation that saved the world from authoritarianism, Nazism, communism, um, really is quite disrespectful and ironic considering she's saying that previous generations don't know about American history when they're the ones who uh, set it up so we have a free future. I, I think that part of what has happened here is it's this, this AOC Instagram Live in and of itself is reflective of the self-absorbed culture that we currently live in. And I hate to diss millennials too, and I cling to my Gen X oh, it's status. Okay. Don't worry. Um, I, right. I, you know, uh, present company excluded. But, you know, <laughs> Thank it, you. honest to God, I mean, what I see here is a self absorbed generation that thinks that because they tweet and because they march with funny hats, that somehow that they have some sort of moral superiority um, that is going to change the world. I, I, my grandfather, who served in World War II, would beg to differ. The greatest generation my, stormed Normandy Beach so that she could Instagram live in her kitchen. That's right. Thank there you, you go. Right? With full face and makeup, I want to point out, and we left out all the kind of completely off the charts discussion about climate change but yeah the one that she also does on Instagram yeah about the diseases i being use frozen instagram in the ice. all the time too so me too i, me too. I love that instagram. person that you were talking about so they complain about how self-absorbed millennials like aoc are you know we're always taking selfies and we're on the twitter and the facebook and then they admitted oh i actually love instagram this aoc Instagram Live in and of itself is reflective of the self-absorbed culture. 12 seconds later. Me too. I love oh, that Instagram. That person that you were talking about. Me too. I oh, love that Instagram. That person that you so what was the point of you criticizing AOC? How is millennials, uh, you know, seeming obsession with social media relevant to what she said about her generation being awesome and second of all are you honestly saying that uh older generations gen x and boomers don't like social media because there's literally subreddits of basically just boomer posts it's called insane people facebook everyone is on social media because we have access to the internet a lot of people do so we're just all on social media in fact i think that platforms like facebook are probably more popular among older generations and instagram is more popular among uh younger generations so i don't even know how that cr uh, criticism was relevant but for them to just basically criticize aoc and millennials for one thing and then admit that they're also guilty of that it shows that they 
they had no objective going into this segment. They just watched something of AOC and they tried to look for a reason to criticize her. See, that just makes you look like hacks. And let's get to AOC's quote here. Quote, I think they're badass, meaning her generation. I think young people are more informed and dynamic than their predecessors. I think they're profoundly courageous because they're willing to puncture taboos and have conversations that, frankly, older generations sometimes struggle to have. How is that controversial? How is that something that is offensive to you? How is that disrespectful to previous generations? How? It's factually correct think about this she says that we're more informed and dynamic than our predecessors we have cell phones now all of us have cell phones we literally have infinite knowledge at our disposal anytime we need it previous generations did not have that access to information had more barriers you had to listen to the radio or you know read the newspaper but you couldn't specifically seek out a very you know, a specific set of information or knowledge about something unless you went to the library. Now we can stay home. I can learn about something while I'm taking a dump. That's what she's talking about here. Access to the information that we seek to grow and educate ourselves with has increased. How is that controversial? Um, she also says that our generation is more willing to puncture taboos. How is that debatable? LGBTQ people have existed since human beings have existed. But yet, we're only talking about that now because my generation has pushed the envelope. We've been open about our sexual orientations and gender identities, whereas that really was taboo for the previous generation. Now, it's probably going to be the case that there are taboos now that my generation won't discuss, that the next generation will. That's just the way that, you know, society functions. You know, there's always growth. Uh, society is always growing. We are always changing. We're just a dynamic species. That's what we are. So how is what she said disrespectful to uh, the previous generations? And all that they could, you know, invoke is people who fought during World War II. So basically, oh, well, really? Millennials are better? What about the people who fought during World War II? Okay, I'm sure that she would say that she respects them. What's your point? It's not an insult to say you think your generation is the best. That's not an insult. Is it an insult to every other country to say that you think America is in the number one country? Because we all know that the nationalists over at Fox News would say that. So I just, I, they are going out of their way to look for reasons to be offended. It's almost as if they're like the snowflakes they frequently denounce on their program. But here's what Brian Kilmeade said. He just straight up made word salad. I don't even understand the point he was trying to make. She graduated and feels she's part of the greatest generation? Hey, our military's as good as it ever is, but right now as a society, there's a reason if you watched the D-Day celebration and saw who fought and what was at stake, you'd be embarrassed. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, I genuinely don't know what he was trying to say. He just knew that he was offended or maybe... You know, he had to be offended, even though what he was saying, it seemed contrived. But he just, he knew that this was an anti-AOC segment, so he had to come up with something. And he couldn't, which is why he just made word salad and came up with this weird, incoherent argument against what she said. When it's not, again, it, it's banal. It, it's unimportant, right? She's not arguing Aren't old people just terrible? Aren't boomers so stupid? Like, aren't their posts really incoherent and batshit insane? She's not making that argument. Jesus Christ. Now, one of the other hosts said, This idea that we're going to say we're better than the greatest generation that saved the world from authoritarianism, Nazism, communism, really is quite disrespectful and ironic considering she's saying that previous generations don't know about American history. So first of all, she did not say that. She did not say that our generation knows more about American history than previous generations. If you're going to lie about her quote, then you can't play the clip for us. You have to hide that away. But she also took issue with... AOC's assertion that we are more informed. Again, we have unlimited knowledge in the palms of our hands. Of course, we are literally more informed because we have that now. And I love how, you know, she threw in, oh, well, the previous generation, the silent generation, the greatest generation, they helped defeat Nazis and communism. Didn't communists help defeat Nazis? And at this point, that's where they kind of lay off of AOC and it just 
it devolved into millennial bashing. And that's when it switched from them being triggered to me being triggered. Because I don't understand why millennials are always the targets of uh, being bashed when we can't help the fact that we graduated into an economy that was not hospitable to us. We graduated during the Great Recession. We will retire into the apocalypse. You guys, the previous generations, you attended college and graduated with little to no debt. You can get a full-time job or even a part-time job working at Taco Bell and within a couple of years, save up enough to buy a house, put yourself through school, buy a car. We don't have that luxury. So I don't understand why people hate millennials so much. And then the other host chimed in and said the greatest generation stormed Normandy Beach so she could Instagram live in her kitchen. I mean, how petty is that? Just admit that you don't like AOC. That You can say the same thing about you. The greatest generation stormed Normandy Beach so you can go on Fox News and espouse these right-wing talking points that are fed to you by Fox News producers. You can say that about anything. What's the point? What does that prove about AOC? How does that prove that her economic and social ideology is bad for people? It doesn't. Now, here's where they kind of show their cards and reveal how stupid they are. A host chimed in and said this about AOC. We left out the off-the-charts discussion about climate change, about the diseases being frozen in ice. So during that Instagram live stream, I haven't seen this, um, AOC apparently talked about how with climate change, with temperatures rising, that will lead to new diseases re-emerging, new for us anyways, that are trapped in the ice. And that Fox News host claimed that AOC was stupid for believing that. But this is a headline from BBC. There are diseases hidden in the ice and they are waking up. Long dormant bacteria and viruses trapped in ice and permafrost for centuries are reviving as the Earth's climate warms. So she's right and you're wrong. And the fact that you insinuated that she might be dumb or insane for suggesting that shows how out of touch and misinformed you are. So this is really the tragedy of this segment. In an attempt to make AOC seem like this, you know, brainless, uh, ditzy young person, they ended up making themselves look like petulant, petty children. And it's just, I honestly, I feel bad for them. Well, I don't really feel bad for them, but I feel bad that they had a goal, they had this objective to attack AOC, and they just ended up putting out this cringe-inducing segment where it just showed that we just attack AOC for the sake of attacking her because she is a political opponent, and we're going to do whatever we can, whenever we can, to try to make her look bad. So if that means we've got to creep on her Instagram and try to see if she says anything you know, that might be deemed controversial, possibly, or maybe we can misinterpret to sell to our audience as controversial, I think that that would behoove us to do. I mean, they had to have thought, what are we supposed to do with this segment? What are we supposed to say about this clip? This isn't really an issue. I don't care about this. Is this really something that we should be attacking her for? When, I mean, maybe we can bring up something else that we disagree with. Maybe a policy. They're just... <laughs> they're just stupid. And they only embarrass themselves here. And they're only helping AOC um, because they're boosting her name recognition. And they're making themselves look idiotic in the process so i guess keep it up because it's not hurting her it's only helping her and hurting you the dnc announced the top 10 candidates that have qualified for the september debate and that includes joe biden bernie sanders kamala harris elizabeth warren pete Buttigieg, beto o'rourke cory booker amy klobuchar andrew yang and julian castro now absent from this list is billionaire Tom Steyer. And I say, good riddance. You never should have been able to run for president because he basically poured millions of dollars into his own campaign with his own money to advertise and get his name out there, which is why he was able to amass 130,000 individual donations. And I just don't think that that's fair. Just because you have more money, that shouldn't give you the edge over other candidates who have been knocking on doors and building up, you know, their name with residents by talking to people. So it just, it's unfair to allow a billionaire to buy his way into the debate. So I'm glad that Tom Steyer's left out another individual that is not qualified. That includes John Delaney, who poured 24 million of his own money 
into his campaign that just went nowhere. What's there to like about John Delaney? He has campaign events where 11 people show up, if he's lucky. So he's going nowhere. It's good that he's excluded because all he's doing is spreading more misinformation about Medicare for All, and we know it's because he has investments in the health industry. So it's good that these bad faith actors will be excluded so that way the more serious candidates can actually have an honest discussion about policy issues that affect the American people. But, you know, the fact that some people will be excluded who I don't believe should be excluded from that third debate, it really is disappointing. So even if we got some good news that Tom Steyer and John Delaney are left out, well, we also got some bad news because also excluded, of course, is Marianne Williamson and also Tulsi Gabbard. And Tulsi Gabbard is the one who I absolutely feel the worst for because she received 165,000 individual donations. There is real grassroots support and online support for her, but she's still left out. So when it comes to the debate criteria, there's two things, two requirements that a candidate needs to meet in order to qualify. The first is they need 130,000 individual donations. Tulsi blew that out of the water. But the second requirement that they need to meet is they need to poll at a minimum of 2% in four DNC qualifying polls. Now, when it comes to DNC qualifying polls, Tulsi Gabbard has unfortunately only reached 2% in two of them. Now, when it comes to polls not qualified by the DNC, Tulsi Gabbard has reached 2% or higher in 24 of them. 24 of them. So this is a situation that is identical to the Mike Gravel situation. He reached that 65,000 individual donor threshold. He uh, met the polling threshold, but he was still excluded. And individuals like Steve Bullock and John Delaney ended up taking his place. And now, even if it's the case that in 24 polls, Tulsi Gabbard met the polling requirement, well, unfortunately, the DNC doesn't consider these polls qualifying polls. Therefore, uh, she will be excluded. She only met one of the two requirements according to the DNC. Now, what organizations have conducted these polls um, that the DNC considers non-qualifying? Well, these aren't from fringe organizations. They're fairly reputable. In fact, I'd say that they're very reputable if you take what 538 has to say with regard to their analysis of these polls. This includes Harvard Harris, Emerson, The Economist and YouGov, Harris X, Change Research, Gravis Marketing, Suffolk University, and the Boston Globe. So it's not like these are fringe polling organizations. And 538 gives them as high of grades, if not higher, than some DNC qualifying polls. So for example, CNN's poll is considered qualifying according to the DNC, but they have a B plus as does Emerson and Suffolk. But those aren't DNC qualifying polls. Now, maybe it's because CNN conducted a poll in conjunction with SSRS, which has an A-, minus. but the point is we're not sure why the DNC considers some polling organizations qualifying and why some are not qualifying. The criteria seems completely arbitrary and random. So what Tulsi Gabbard has done is, I think, very reasonably called on the DNC to be transparent. If some polls are DNC qualifying and some polls are not, then please release the criteria that you use to evaluate these polls because it doesn't make any sense. It seems like since you're lacking transparency here, you can just pick and choose the polls in order to include or exclude candidates that you do or don't want there. And that's not acceptable. So Tulsi's campaign released a statement and here's a couple of paragraphs from that statement. The presidential campaign of U.S. Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard is calling on the Democratic National Committee to revise their list of debate qualifying polls to ensure transparency and fairness in light of numerous irregularities in the selection and timing of those polls. The Gabbard campaign is calling on the DNC to hold true to their promise and make adjustments to the process now to ensure transparency and fairness. Crucial decisions on debate qualifications that impact the right of the American people to have the opportunity to participate fully in the democratic process should not be made in secret by party bosses. For the sake of democracy, those decisions must be made openly with clear and consistent standards and a sufficient window of opportunity for candidates to demonstrate genuine grassroots momentum and enthusiasm. And I think that that is perfectly reasonable. So what happened to Tulsi Gabbard here 
is exactly what happened to Mike Gravel, except I would argue that Tulsi Gabbard even has a stronger case to be included than Mike Gravel because she blew that first requirement out of the park. And there's enough polls where she reached at least 2% to where it feels, it feels wrong to exclude her. But yet, here we are. Now, Tulsi is not my number one candidate. Bernie Sanders is my number one candidate. Bernie Sanders is my first, second, third, fourth, so on and so forth choice. Uh, but Tulsi Gabbard is a good candidate. I have my criticisms of her, but I think that her being on that debate stage, it does, to an extent, push the Overton window to the left, at least with regard to foreign policy, if she gets the chance to speak enough. So to not have her there is frustrating just from a policy standpoint. But in terms of the optics, after that debacle that happened in 2016, the DNC should be going out of their way to be fair to candidates and extra transparent. But we're not getting that here. And I'm not just going to care about fairness and transparency when it affects my candidate. The standards should be universal and they should be applied equally to each and every single candidate. There's been countless times when the Democratic Party establishment will use their institutional advantages to marginalize grassroots candidates. And I think that that is totally unacceptable. I think that making grassroots fundraising one of the requirements to qualify for the debates in the first place was a great idea. But at the same time, if you're not going to be transparent, then, I mean, you're, you're not going to garner trust. You're not going to win back the people you lost after what you did in 2016. We have to have a consistent standard. And the DNC should be held to a consistent standard, and we're not getting that here. The fact that we don't know why some polls qualify and some don't qualify when they are reputable based on 538's analyses, and I have issues with Nate Silver, I think everyone does, but, I mean, just in evaluating and grading these polls, they're legitimate, they're reputable, so I just, I don't understand why the DNC would choose some polls over others. It's almost like they have an agenda and they're trying to shut out candidates who they don't like. And we all know Tulsi Gabbard is hated and loathed by the establishment because she bucked party orthodoxy when she resigned from the DNC in 2016 in order to endorse Bernie Sanders. And at that last debate, she single-handedly killed Kamala's campaign. Kamala is hanging on by a thread. So they don't want... Uh, Tulsi Gabbard to get in there and, you know, throw that death blow to Kamala Harris. At the end of the day, I feel really bad for Tulsi Gabbard's supporters here, and I feel bad for Tulsi Gabbard because she's been working her butt off to qualify, and then this happens, arbitrarily so. But I mean, look, this isn't surprising. It happened to Mike Gravel, and we're seeing this happen again. So this is why you have to be hyper vigilant and always keep an eye on the DNC because they have an agenda. They don't want grassroots funded candidates to be included in the conversation because they know that anyone who poses a threat to the status quo or speaks out against the status quo is someone who would hurt their bottom line ultimately. And with candidates like Bernie Sanders, he has so much support that they can't possibly find a way to exclude him yet based on this arbitrary criteria. But for anyone else, like Marianne Williamson or Mike Gravel or Tulsi Gabbard, they will find some reason to exclude them. Now, it's not as clear why Marianne Williamson was excluded um, based on you know what she said on Twitter. It just seems like she didn't reach 2% in enough polls. But with Tulsi Gabbard, having reached 2% or higher in 24 polls, it's just dirty for them to exclude her. So they're already on thin ice. They voted down a climate change debate, presumably because the members who voted against it wanted to protect Joe Biden, who has one of the worst records on the environment in that race, who would only, you know, have another chance to make gaffes and word salad on a national stage and hurt his numbers more. So the DNC, they're never, ever going to win back the trust of their voters um, or anyone who would be inclined to vote for the Democratic Party by doing things like this, by going out of their way brazenly to shield other establishment-friendly candidates. It's grotesque, and we absolutely have to call it out and speak out against what they're doing here, because this is arbitrary, and it's wrong.
Hello everyone, I am here with Rebecca Parson. She is running in Washington State's 6th Congressional District as a Democratic Socialist, and she is here to talk about her progressive political campaign. Rebecca, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hi Mike, thanks for having me, I'm excited. I'm very excited to have you on. There's so many great candidates running, I can't keep track of even half of them, but it's nice yeah. to talk to <laughs> as many as I possibly can. So you're challenging Derek Kilmer, in this district, he's been a representative here since 2013. He is a very establishment, pretty conservative Democrat, and you are running as a non-corrupt, grassroots-funded Democratic Socialist. You're a member of the LGBTQ community. Your platform is absolutely fantastic, and your history is absolutely robust. So just let us know why you decided to run and um, why you think you are better than Derek Kilmer. Yeah, so we have had this representation since 2013. And before we had Representative Derek Kilmer, we had uh, Norm Dix, who was very similar to Derek Kilmer. And he actually handpicked Derek Kilmer to run when he decided to retire. So we've had about 30, 40 unbroken years of exactly the same type of corporate uh, Democratic representation. And I first started thinking about running after Trump won because I thought, well, if Trump can get elected, then maybe <laughs> if he can get elected president, maybe I can get elected to something. And I think it would be a good way to serve. And it served served my community. I got more and more interested. I was thinking about it. Uh, I actually co-led Indivisible Tacoma for about a year and a half. And um, I love the Indivisible Guide. I think it's super smart the way it takes the Tea Party tactics and then applies it. Um, to what we want on the liberal or progressive agenda. Uh, but what I found is that it's pretty difficult when we have Democratic represent representatives, or at least the ones that we do in this area, they just don't budge. And they'll just give platitudes like, you know, well, let's get more Dems voted, you know, vote blue no matter who. Let's, you know, get more good Dems elected in other parts. And, you know, my hands are tied. There's only so much I can do. And, you know, would call and call and write and write and go to their offices and just get like form letter responses. And, you know, it's almost like contacting Comcast, like dear value customer form letter. <laughs> <laughs> like nothing changes. It's like pulling and, teeth. Yeah, it is. And so I started to think about that uh, actually running against Derek Kilmer for this seat. And all around the district, you know, it's a large district, it includes the entire Olympic Peninsula, which is the northwesternmost part of Washington State, it includes Tacoma, where I am as well. So it's a very big area. It includes a national park and forest. And but all over the district in the rural and urban areas are progressives who are really tired of this representation and of him not listening to us and not supporting the policies we want. And not only is he does he take a lot of money from corporate interests, including Wall Street, defense, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, real estate, lots of these industries which are devastating our district because you know we're struggling with addiction, homelessness, rising rents, uh, people being pushed out of their housing, and in the urban and rural areas we have the same problems um, that we're facing these these really big issues. And, uh, you know, not only is he a corporate Democrat, but he's chair of the New Democrats, which is the third way centrist caucus of conservative Democrats in Congress. And it's just, you know, nothing. We're not going to get the chair of the third of, of the third way, you know, New Democrats in Congress uh, to co-sponsor Medicare for all or the Green New Deal is just not going to happen. And uh, I actually heard from some activists who met with his staff recently uh, in district. Uh, they asked him, you know, they were asking about the Green New Deal. They asked the staffer and the staffer said, no, he's not going to co-sponsor it. So we got an answer on that. Uh, Medicare for all, we've just been getting a lot of prevarication and kind of putting us off and stuff. And, you know, we just really, really need these policies here. Uh, you know, on the Olympic Peninsula, we had the timber industry for years and years. And the companies just kind of Ex, you know, deforested a lot of land, extracted the profit, and then left, and it left behind this gaping hole. And uh, one of my friends there on the Olympic Peninsula, the way she puts it, is if a community could have PTSD, this is what it would look like. And, you know, addiction, homelessness, suicide, unemployment, you know, there aren't many jobs. The jobs that are there don't pay well. You can't work 40 hours a week and live. And there are, for example, Aberdeen, which is where Kurt Cobain was from, that's in my district. And the town has 16,000 people, a thousand of them are homeless. So one in 16 people are homeless. It's just a gigantic problem. And the same in Tacoma, you know, uh, there's, 
we have an addiction problem here as well. There's one detox facility in the entire city that takes Medicaid. It's almost always full. You know, I think the two number one things we can do to address, you know, successfully address the addiction epidemic here and maybe in other, in other parts of the country as well, but like definitely here where I've been talking to voters and, and residents is uh, number one, Medicare for all so that uh, people can get drug treatment, detox, and ongoing mental health services. So they can get clean and sober and stay clean and sober. Um, so I'll say actually three things. And the second one is housing is a human right. So I support national rent control, as well as a massive investment in public housing, which I think will go a long way towards eradicating homelessness. And then the third thing is a federal jobs guarantee, which um, I think is extremely important economically that everybody should be able to work 40 hours a week and afford to live. And it should be a, you know, $15 plus living wage union job. But the other thing that's great about the federal jobs guarantee is that it addresses the pervasive despair that's all over the district. Like, well, what's the point? Like, I'm just going to grind out the rest of my life working two or three part-time jobs because no employer will hire me full-time because they want to avoid giving me benefits, you know? So grinding it out at these jobs, barely making it, like despair really sets in hard. With that, you know, you know that you have that to look forward to for your whole life. And if people have a federal jobs guarantee where it's like, if you want a job, you can get one, it's going to pay well, you know, where you don't have to spend more than 30% of your income on housing and you can have, you know, vacation every year and raise your kids and pay for the things that you want and need. Like, I think it would just go such a long way to giving people lives that they don't feel the need to check out of. So those are some of my policies and, and why I'm running. And it's really nice to hear you talk about all of these solutions. Like you have answers for all of these problems that are originating in your community due to, you know, largely corporatization. And what's interesting, you know, one thing that really stood out to me on your website, because I can kind of relate, is that you kind of stress, you know, Washington State is one of the bluest states in the country, if not the bluest, but yet the representation coming out of there, it's just, it's corporate Democrat, it's mealy mouth, it's centrism. And so it's really nice to see a ton of different progressives really rise up. I mean, Joshua Collins is running in uh, Denny Hex district. We have Sarah Smith, and there are a plethora of others. And, you know, as someone who is in a neighboring state, I kind of feel the same way, whereas now we have a challenger to Earl Blumenauer. So it's just a matter of, you know, it's time that we get the representation that actually lines up with the priorities of the people in that district. So it's nice to hear you just list all of, you know, these things just yeah. right away <laughs> that will solve so many problems. Um, because I just, I just feel like people in Congress, they get comfortable. They really, as you stated, he was hand selected by his predecessor and we need people who are going to represent their actual constituents and be attentive to the details, you know, in the community, the problems in that community. And for you, you have such a robust history. Like, I kind of just want to go over some of the things. Um, I can't possibly list all of it, but you have such a unique record here just in terms mm -hmm. of an activist. So you were a human rights observer in the Zapatista village in Mexico. That is incredibly fascinating <laughs> to me. Um, you worked with genocide scholars and you really see that, you know, care for human rights reflected in your platform. Um, you, um, you were a teacher. And then one thing that really struck me was you said that, you know, you saw firsthand how zip codes really reflect the quality and type of education that you receive. So talk a little bit about your background and what you think kind of propelled you to this position that you're in now, where you identify as a democratic socialist. Like, what do you think in your life was the most meaningful that really kind of led you to this current path? Yeah, there's a bunch of things. And, and the genocide studies started in college. I took a course on genocide studies. And it just happened that at my small state school, and, uh, we had a an expert, you know, the founder of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. So he offered this course in, at the undergrad level. And it was extremely interesting. It was where I first, I think, started to learn and understand how uh, the U.S. military um, works overseas, uh, what really goes on there. Um, and cases where we choose to intervene and those where we don't intervene and why. And um, I, then I interned with that organization and I got a scholarship to present a paper at their 2007 conference in Sarajevo. And that was, I believe, the 12th anniversary of the Srebrenica massacre, which was the largest massacre on European soil since World War II. And um, I th over a thousand or I think thousands of men, uh, mostly men and boys, 
um, but also children and girls were uh, massacred there. And every year, at least, I'm not sure at, at this point anymore if they still are, but at that point, they were still uncovering the mass graves. And so I went, I presented the conference, and then we actually went to the um, burial, you know, every year they have a funeral for the people that they have dug up and identified. And we, you know, I stood at the edge of a mass grave and could look in and see um, people, bones and clothes. And th there was a young man there who was about my age and he was translating for us. And as he was translating, like a single tear was going down his face. Uh, because he was from that area and he knew people who had been massacred. I saw that and I was like, this is what happens when we have dehumanizing language. You know, my professor, Dr. Gregory Stanton, created a framework called the 10 Stages of Genocide, and it shows you the predictable but not inexorable path that genocide goes along. And one of the earliest is dehumanizing and using dehumanizing language, calling people vermin, pests, stuff like that. You know, in Guatemala, they referred to, you know, if we can't fill the if we can't uh, kill the fish, we'll just drain the water, um, and that was referring to like the villages, you know, draining their support outside the villages. But when you refer to people as vermin, animals, pests, this kind of thing, like that's an early stage of what I saw at the very end. And so I'm not saying like that's where we're headed here, but I'm saying because I can't predict the future, but I'm saying it's extremely concerning, and um, that was one big thing that has always stuck with me. And then through that class, I got interested in Guatemala because uh, Guatemala had a 30 plus year civil war and it was kicked off by our intervention uh, and our intervention in starting a coup in Guatemala, toppling the democratically elected leader. And then during that genocide, during that civil war, there was a genocide of the Mayan population in Guatemala. And I was interested in learning more about it. So that's where I went uh, for a few months to study Spanish and then I had heard about the Zapatistas from some friends of mine in college and how they had this kind of self-governing society um, of indigenous people who had taken power for themselves. And it was just fascinating to me. So I went, I, they had a language school. So I went there for a week to language school. And then I did two 10 day trips as a human rights observer in a Zapatista village in the jungle um, because it was good. We weren't using this term back then, but the idea was like white privilege, especially white foreigner, white American privilege, like with the Mexican funded, Mexican government funded paramilitaries, um, they're much less likely to, uh, they're constantly threatening villages, but they're much less likely to actually do something with um, white Americans and Europeans that are recording. And, um, so that was, I did that. And it, that was just incredible. Like the Zapatistas have um, drastically lowered maternal mortality rates. Um, they've increased the status of women. Women have much more uh, stronger uh, rights than they do in the surrounding communities and, and in Mexico as a whole, I think. Um, they have schools, hospitals, clinics. Um, they control millions of dollars worth of like farming and millions of acres of land. And it's all self-determined in true democratic fashion, like true uh, democracy where they get to choose how they live. And it's not just political democracy, it's economic democracy. And it's just, I got to see Naomi Klein speak there with Subcomandante Marcos and just incredible. Her book, The Shock Doctrine, was one thing that also like really opened my eyes. Um, you know, we invade Iraq and then set up McDonald's. I mean, I, her book is much more complicated than that, but if you want to just put it in a nutshell. Yeah. And then um, in Albuquerque, yeah, I lived there. I was a substitute teacher and I saw, I taught in uh, private schools, Catholic schools and public schools. And I saw how different it is even within the public school system you know, kids just one or two miles apart have totally different experiences. You know, one school, all the kids are getting free breakfast and lunch. And another one, they're coming with their nice, you know, lunch packed by their parents and stuff. And why is that? And, you know, the poverty and uh, systemic racism. Um, and then I think in terms of like moving to identifying as a democratic socialist, it was seeing uh, Bernie Sanders talk about it and then AOC talk about it. And her election was just extremely inspiring. Like I uh, have been on the email list of Justice Democrats and Brand New Congress uh, since they started. And I remember getting their first emails um, back in, I guess it would have been early 2017, and being like literally thrilled because like, this is where the vision is. This is where it's happening. This is not the corporate bullshit. Like this is really uh, a, a left progressive vision that's really gonna help people. And I got the first email from, I don't remember which one of the two it was, but like, hey, he's, here's our newest 
um, slate of candidates we've just announced and AOC being one of them. And when she started to rise, I was following her and then she won. I looked back through my email inbox. I was like, there was that first email where she was just there, like, you know, local local organizer, bartender, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> and then she went on to win and I watched the whole thing happen. And it was just incredibly inspiring. And isn't it amazing how there's only um, like a handful of justice Democrats in office and they are the ones who get all the attention. They're the loudest. They've become the face of the Democratic Party, um, according to a lot of people, which is arguable, of course, but just in a matter of a year and not even a year. Right. And it's so amazing. So the way that I kind of keep myself from getting too cynical, you know, when I just look at things from like a number perspective in terms of corporate Democrats versus progressive Democrats, is to think of the impact that people have. And if we add like just 10 more justice Democrats, what a momentous impact that would be. Like we're getting such a powerful little block in Congress that we really can, like the Tea Party in a way, kind of dictate policy, drive the discussion, drive political discourse. And it really is so exciting to see. And what I love is that as I learn about each of these candidates and talk to them and look at their backgrounds, like you can kind of see in their policy platform all of their life experiences reflected there. Like I really see, you know, a heavy emphasis on human rights in your platform. And it's just so fascinating. One thing that really stood out to me, because I don't see, you know, too many candidates talking about this. Um, we have, you know, the standard Medicare for all, free college and whatnot. But you emphasize something that's extremely important to me. So it's ending rank choice or excuse me, ending gerrymandering and instituting nationwide wide ranked choice voting. Um, talk a little bit about this because this is so important. This really could be a game changer because if we have electoral reform, that would really pave the way potentially for multiple parties. Like people talk about a third party, but I always argue we don't need a third party. We need like multiple parties. We need yeah, five we need or ten six. Parties. We need <laughs> yeah. robust yeah. like political ideologies represented in Congress. So why is this something that's really important and a key plank to you? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, you know, and I've heard people say, and I think it's right, that in other countries, the progressives and centrists would not be in the same party. Right. <laughs> and we, we don't really belong in the same party. Like, we have this two, you know, I'm a Democratic PCO, I support, you know, it's because of Democrats that, you know, I was able to get married. Like, right. absolutely, they are different from Republicans in ways that have materially impacted my life. But we are also like, you know, moderates or centrists compared to me, very different on some things. And so if we, um, you know, had ranked choice voting, I think it would really get rid of this kind of uh, lesser of two evils approach to voting. It would uh, let people vote for who they're really excited about. It would be much more fair. You know, ending gerrymandering is extremely important to me because we just have these absurd districts. You know, they go like that and then around and that kind of thing so that they can um, have the voters they want and also enact voter suppression, particularly of um, people of color and black voters. So it's extremely important. Yeah, that's one thing that's really been on my radar. And um, there there was a bill, um, and I'm, I'm blanking on the number currently, that I believe Ro Khanna sponsored that actually did just that. Like it it um, it actually moved to multi-member districts, and I can't remember the number there. The district magnitude was like two or three, which is still great, um, and did ranked choice voting and did gerrymandering, and it didn't get a lot of support, and I think it's because people don't really know about the specifics. Like a lot of people have this idea that if we just organize a third party, that's how we can get it into power. But there are real institutional barriers that make that so difficult and passing something like ring choice voting, that's really the first step. It's not a guarantee because nobody really knows how those institutions will you know, affect party politics and whatnot, but it's just the, it's one of the necessities needed. So we can actually have some choices in this country because it, like yeah. you said, we should not have to share a party with centrists, <laughs> you know, it, it's economically speaking, you know, centrist Democrats are very much aligned with Republicans, not of course the same, but very close, but in terms of mm -hmm. social politics and issues related to social justice and um, whatnot, they are aligned more with progressives so we're forced to form this alliance and that makes us a little bit less, I think, effective because we're always butting heads. Whereas with Republicans, you know, they're all lined up on everything pretty much for the most part. And it's allowed them, I think, to be a lot more effective, uh, not just in terms of shifting the narrative in the Overton window, but elect electorally speaking, you know. So let's talk about your platform a little bit more. You have a really robust platform, but 
it's going to be difficult to fight for all the things that we need to fix our country. So first year, I always like to ask the candidates, what do you think would be your top two or top three priorities in terms of what you think you can realistically accomplish in the event we're assuming we have a Bernie Sanders president and, you know, a Democratic Senate and House? Best case yeah. scenario, you know, what do you think you would push for in that first year? Yeah, and that's what my dream is to happen is we have Bernie Sanders in the White House. We have a Democratic Senate and House. And then I think it could really be the start of a new era. You know, like Pete Buttigieg talks about, let's bring in a new era. Like, that's not, you're not a you're new You're not era. that new era. <laughs> that centrist <laughs> stuff is not, that is not a new era. A new yeah. era is, is a Democratic Socialist president. Mm -hmm. And then like a Democratic Socialist group of people or caucus or whatever you want to say in Congress. And then actually, you know, sweeping it in, like the era of Reaganism and Clintonism and all of that is over. This is the new, new deal. And I think it could be so exciting. And we could look back on it in history as like, this is when a new tide swept in of like, progressivism to really get stuff done and it completely changed the country and i think it's just so exciting that all, there are all these candidates around the country running to make that happen and my top three would be the green new deal because that's one of the reasons i'm running you know people ask why didn't you choose something more attainable or you know what makes you think you can do this start small or if they're you know friends of mine who are just concerned they'll say you know like you're a great candidate that's why i want you to run for something you can actually win <laughs> and uh so the reason i think i can win it you know i'm in it to win it and i think there's a definite path to victory and um one of but one of the reasons that i didn't wait is that doing the traditional political path to make myself, you know, deemed viable by the establishment, you know, um, going through all the steps, all the things I need to do, that would take much, I, that, I would get to that point by way past 2030. <laughs> and we do not have the time for that. And Representative Derek Ilmer is not going to support the Green New Deal. And we need action right now. Like We need a Congress in 2020 that elected in 2020 that is going to make it happen. Um, because that's an existential threat. And I think as well, I really like that the Green New Deal includes all these different elements of addressing what's some of the fundamental issues of our country, like making sure that it's racially just, and that is just from a class perspective as well, that it has the federal jobs guarantee. So what's great about it, and for one of many things that is great about the Green New Deal is it addresses this existential threat. And then it also addresses other extremely serious problems that we need to tackle. The next thing, not next, but, you know, these three um, priority things would be uh, Medicare for all and true single payer Medicare for all, not kind of a lightweight plan. I'm not going to co-sponsor it and then say, oh, I don't know anymore. I went to talk in the Hamptons and I'm not sure anymore if I like it. <laughs> like, no, I am. <laughs> I am on the board of whole Washington, which is a Washington state organization fighting to get single payer health care in Washington state. And we're doing it by initiative. We did um, an initiative to the people. And this time we're doing an initiative to the legislature. And, like, you know, we have a very good shot of making it happen. I think we are going to make it happen. And um, I think that um, it's great to have this be going on, like, uh, dual tracks at the same time nationally and statewide. But, you know, I'm on that because I don't believe in these kind of halfway solutions. You know, that's another reason that it's so urgent is that people are literally dying because they don't have access to health care. And that's the thing. Like you get into Congress, you get your nice health care and then you deny us what you have. You know, you have nice, cushy health care and you won't give it to us. You won't let us have it because you take hundreds of thousands of dollars from phar the pharmaceutical industry and the health insurance industry. And Derek Kilmer, you know, he's taking money from a big pharma pack. The members of that pack are currently being sued for manufacturing the opioid epidemic, which is decimating our district. There's one county in my district, Clallam County, where they found that over a six, there was a report in the paper recently over a six year period that people were prescribed on average 60 to 70 addictive prescription pills per person. And now they have one of the highest opioid death rates in the state. You know, there's no coincidence. It's cause and effect. And so, you know, we absolutely need Medicare for all that includes vision, dental uh, and drug treatment and therapy uh, and mental health. And then the third thing would be housing policy. I think that we need national rent control and accompanied by a massive investment in public housing so that the rent is stabilized. But there's also enough units for people. Currently, there's a shortage, I think, of about 12 million units. And uh, national rent control is super exciting to me because so far the fight has been local and state. And I've been involved in it locally with the Tacoma Tenants Organizing Committee, um, which formed after a mass eviction. And we just have these mass evictions happen in Tacoma 
with regularity. You know, developer comes in, they buy a unit, evict everybody in it. Usually they were low income, on disability, in recovery. Evict them. Um, there, Many of them become homeless. This particular apartment building, um, two people have died since being evicted. And that's one thing that I think our establishment corporate Democrats don't understand is that housing is a matter of life and death. If you're in recovery and you go, you're out on the streets, that threatens your recovery. If you are disabled, you know, there is a woman in Aberdeen who I met who moved to Aberdeen from somewhere else in Washington State to be closer to family. And she uh, got to the apartment she had found. It was the only thing she could afford. She got there and found it didn't have a ramp for her wheelchair. The landlord refused to put one in and he just said, never mind. Um, I'm just going to use it as an office because he didn't want to put the ramp in. And she didn't have anywhere else to live. That was the only place she found that she could afford, you know. So she went to the bus station uh, where she was able to plug in her wheelchair and just sat there in her wheelchair for three nights, just sitting there in her chair until somebody from the station called somebody at the homeless camp. Uh, We have a homeless encampment in Aberdeen, um, and there's a guy there who's kind of like the coordinator. Um, He lives there and he coordinates and they had his number. They called him and they came and got her. But it's like, this woman is a senior citizen in a wheelchair in a Greyhound station for three nights straight, day and night. Like that's the result of our broken housing system and housing is for housing. It's for people to live in. That's its primary purpose. It is not for people to make money off of. It's not for speculation. It's not for flipping. Housing is for people. And that's what my policy is about. And um, we've had some amazing wins around the country with local rent control and statewide. I think that um, with national rent control, we could really fill in some of those gaps. Like, um, you know, centrists make the argument that, well, in San Francisco, when they implemented rent control, um, then the rent just outside San Francisco went up. Um, that's been disputed whether that study is true or not. I think it might just be, you know, a centrist, a third way talking point. Um, but even if it were true, okay, so you're saying that the way one person put it to me was like, okay, we have a leaky bucket. That doesn't prove we shouldn't have buckets. It just proves we should <laughs> fix the holes. Right. And what we need is national universal rent control that applies to everywhere in the country. Um, and then accompanied with an investment in public housing. So those would be my top three uh, Green New Deal, Medicare for All, and housing. I like that. And um, when you, I first of all, I love the leaky bucket analogy. But it sounds like that person is making the case for a national, you know, housing and uh, rent control type system. No, but one thing that really stood out to me on your website because now I think that you and I we're, we're realizing that there are people who know that they have to say they support Medicare for All because it's going to be difficult to get elected when the overwhelming majority of the Democratic Party base wants it. Um, but you have to really differentiate between who's real and who isn't. Like Tim Ryan was on the debate stage, you know, talking about how horrible Medicare for All is, but he co-sponsored Pramila Jayapal's yeah. bill. So I yeah, love right. how on your website you put very clearly <laughs> Medicare for All, real Medicare for All, single payer, no incrementalism. Like I just kind of like <laughs> did a little applause right there when I saw that because it's it's so important. Um, yeah. So I, I absolutely love everything that you're talking about. You've hit your opponent for supporting the TPP. Um, supporting anti-free speech condemnations of BDS. So anyone who's in that district, they're going to know that you are the real deal. I think to me, the real objective is just making sure that people know who you are and know that you exist. Because when you present them with this option between an establishment entrenched Democrat who's a centrist and someone who actually cares, who's hungry to get in there and fight, they're going to choose you over him. It's just a matter of getting your name out there. So let me allow you to make your pitch. I think that anyone who's watching will be won over. It, the audience already is going to love you, I can tell. But tell <laughs> people why it's so important to go that extra step and share you know, information about you, um, donate to you, and sign up to support you. Even if you don't live in the 6th Congressional District of Washington, you can still phone bank for Rebecca. So just basically make your pitch and tell us what we can do to support your campaign campaign. Yeah, and thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. So it's really important to share um, information about, you know, go to Twitter, uh, follow me, uh, share my tweets, engage. I'm really active on there and I engage with people. And it's important because um, Representative Kilmer is not that well known nationally, but he has a very critical role as chair of the New Democrats. And this is a role that I believe Joe Crowley had about 10 years ago. And so it's something that you kind of take on your path to building your career up into leadership of the House. 
you know, and I would not be surprised if he's kind of piecing together a career so eventually he can be Speaker of the House. And, you know, as chair of the New Democrats, he has power of the purse over like where, you know, the New Democrats coalition spends a lot of money on campaigns. They funnel it to other centrists. Uh, he also belongs to the new to No Labels PAC, which um, <laughs> there's a Washington Post headline saying, uh, what was it? Um, no, it's not. No labels is the pack, I think. And then the problem solvers is the caucus in Congress. And the Washington Post headline was something like critics allege that the problem solvers have solved few problems. <laughs> I was like, yeah, they <laughs> they really haven't. They've actually caused more problems. Yeah. You know, like Seth Moulton is part of them. The problem solvers were, were behind the push to not have Nancy Pelosi be speaker, which, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Pelosi, but she was, I think, the best choice we had. And well, they the wanted someone solvers, to the right of her, which exactly, is yeah. unfathomable. Like she yeah <laughs> she's already conservative so it's like yeah. what do you what do you expect a republican sorry that's what they want that's <laughs> yeah. what they want you know yeah. they're like pride themselves on being a bipartisan republican and democrat they're funded by republican billionaires and dark money it's not like no labels it's just it's the one percent versus the rest of us that's just the epitome of it and so i think it's really important because um taking down the chair you know me winning and you know, defeating the chair of the New Democrats would really send a message that the third way stuff is not working and that it's on its way to extinction. And that what's really gonna work in this country is progressive democratic socialist ideas. And um, in my district as well, um, you know, Derek Kilmer has name recognition and that's something I need to really build up. And I'm gonna do that with a massive canvassing campaign. I have lots of volunteers who are reaching out who are already involved in helping me and are like, just tell us where to go. We're ready. We're going to go do it. We're going to knock every single door in this county. Like they are so ready and they've been waiting and wanting this to happen. And so I'm going to be doing a lot of voter contact, going to a lot of events and meeting people, uh, which I've already been doing. It's just been so incredibly exciting. Like I'm going off on a tangent a little bit, but I was uh, canvassing with a Green New Deal group, which is out canvassing in rural Washington to make sure that the Green New Deal um, is good for rural Washington as well as for the cities. And we went door to door. And after we would explain what the Green New Deal is, we would ask them, show them a list of policies and say, if the Green New Deal happened, uh, which one of these policies or uh, which of these policies would be most important to you? And it was stuff like uh, universal childcare, uh, federal jobs guarantee, it was just a laundry list of progressive policies. <laughs> and they would look at it. And even the people who said they voted for Trump which we didn't ask them, they would just volunteer it. Even those people would say, well, I don't know, it's hard to say because I really like all of these. I'm like, yes, you know, I'm, not, I'm not targeting my message to try to win over conservatives. I'm targeting my message based on what is best for the people. And working class people look at this and say, this is what I want. And so helping get my message out, getting more attention to me will really help the working class people of this district, which is a very working class district. And so... Uh, you can help me by getting on my email list. Um, that's one of the top two things that a candidate needs to do when they're at an early stage like mine, you know, fundraising and uh, getting people on their email list so they can stay in touch. And you can go to Rebecca for WA.com slash humanist. And I have a page set up there for um, viewers of the show where you can sign up for my email list. I, that would be the number one thing I would ask you to do. And it would be really, really helpful so that I can stay in touch and build my audience and also have back and forth. You know, like when you get an email from me, you can just respond. And that's the thing uh, with a lot of email lists. You just get it, especially from the DCCC. It's like the sky is falling. Donate money now. <laughs> and, you know, if you if you write back, it's like you're just going to whatever consultant is writing these BS emails is not going to write back. But, you know, if you write back to me, like you could very well get a response and you're like, I will definitely read it. So get onto the list. That would be great. Rebecca for WA.com slash humanist. And then I'm on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Rebecca for WA. Um, on social media and my site, it's R-E-B-E-C-C-A-F-O-R-W-A. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program. Again, that's Rebecca for WA.com. Phenomenal candidate. This is a national movement, and we will all be watching this race closely and, of course, rooting for you because, I mean, it just like, let me just say this. Whenever I talk to someone, like, 
I can tell within the first five minutes just how enthusiastic they are. And you never see that like from these centrist corporate Democrats, like these new candidates, they're ready to get in and fight. And it's just so refreshing to see it. And whenever I talk to you guys, I get amped up myself. I just get excited because it's like, finally, you know, something is happening <laughs> all together. We are coalescing around this movement and this message. And, it, and it's great to see. So if you can, please support Rebecca. This is a national movement. What she does in the sixth congressional district isn't just going to affect that district. This is a national movement it will help you as well so please support her and get involved thank you so much rebecca it's been a blast thank you mike well, that's all that I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far and listened to me speak for that long, as usual, we can't end the show without thanking all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members. I also want to send a shout out to um, anyone who listens to us on iTunes and SoundCloud. I absolutely appreciate your viewership or listenership, if you will. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm done talking. I don't know what else to say. I will see you all next week. Take care, everyone.